I mean, come on. It was aliens. Obviously, it was aliens, guys. You're listening to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Angels and Demons and Monsters and Serpents to Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. Coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science. Nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed, a high atop the Edwards Plateau. Is that door shut? Yeah, and I'm breaking the cardinal rule of podcasting. All right. Ah, having a glass of wine. At the beginning on of the show. segment one. <laughs> Get ready, folks. <laughs> so we're taking a break from the book report uh, this week. Uh, we have a lot of things to report here. So first of all, we'll say congratulations to our buddy Ty. Who yeah, buddy. Many of you probably know from us mentioning him on the show. He was a uh, first call in, first time caller, long time listener, first time caller. That's right. Only caller ever. <laughs> Except for Randall. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. Randall is a. Um, but yeah, so he got married. He uh, and we, of course, attended the wedding and had duties. And Kyle was Rock like, and roll. Yeah, Kyle was like in the wedding party. Plus, we played music. And uh, so we did that. Threw down. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was. Yep. And Lisa is uh, really awesome. Yes. So good she is. And yeah, I think we talked about the engagement party on the show too. So it happened, folks. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the other thing I want to mention uh, I want to give a shout out to our buddy, uh, John Brzezinski. Uh, he was, he's godfather to Soul, Kyle's child, and he passed away. When was it? Like this past week? Um, week like a week ago, yeah. Saturday. Yeah. Uh, John was amazing. Uh, awesome photographer. Uh, I knew he was a photographer, but I hadn't really seen, you know, the, the genius of his prints until we, we were over at their house the other day after the funeral. And, uh, his wife was showing us some of the prints that he got this really awesome printer and God, the captures he got on I yeah. mean, just amazing. Uh, also great musician, also a, like a guitar tech. So like he, he, many of you may have seen uh, the guitars that are sometimes hanging in the, in the back, you know, on when we do video shows or when we're on Cosmographia. And lots, I've seen lots of people ask, you know, what's is what is that? Uh, is that a P90 on that? Yeah, that American Telecaster has a P90 pickup on it and a Seymour Duncan quarter pounder. That uh, John, I mean, he just basically he threw that thing onto his countertop and took it apart, and then grabbed a router <laughs> and just <laughs> just right in the kitchen, just <laughs> just routed out the <laughs> the hole for the pickup. It scared the crap out of me. Yeah, but uh, yeah, he was he was great. He put, I mean, he knew everything about, like all the technical details about the components that go into the electronics of a guitar, where they were manufactured, and why the better ones came from this manufacturing plant in Korea, and where they source their copper and all that. I mean, he just yeah, it's just crazy. And you know, m- most people that knew him probably didn't even have any idea that he. Uh, he knew anything about guitars, but he had awesome amps and guitars. And every time we'd go over there, he'd be like, hey, uh, come to the back room, check this out. Yeah. <laughs> and he w- he and he liked to crank it to 11. Oh yeah. He was always <laughs> cranked to 11. I could barely, I could barely jam the way he'd turn it up. And I'm like, I don't know, man, I'd turn the volume knob on the guitar to like two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was great. Uh, great cook. Yep. Uh, great photographer. Excellent coffee. Family he was, man. He was a coffee aficionado. Great builder. Yeah. He was an amazing carpenter and uh, loved uh, fast cars and That's right. He was also loud a guitars car dude. and yeah. yeah, just loud guitars and fast cars and guns. Uh, yes. <laughs> Lots of guns. <laughs> yeah. It just uh yeah, great guy and uh, we're going to miss him. That's right. So yeah, shout out to you John wherever you are. On your next adventure. And to the family. And to the family. We love all of you. Yeah. So, uh, what else do we have? We have any agricultural update? The farm is mud. That's right. That's all. It's. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. 
That is all. <laughs> a lot of rain here recently, folks. <laughs> the pond is full. That's right. Yeah, and I guess the, the trees... Oh, dang it. Set this the up. trees out in uh, uh, the other place where we planted the olive trees, they didn't do too well, in the I guess, in the freeze. So we'll see what happens with that. I don't think they completely died, but... Uh, yeah, they, they definitely froze above ground. So we'll see how that goes. Saved them from the ants, but we couldn't save them from the weather. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so. Uh, but yes, you're right. Everything is mud. So I guess that's that's we're done with the agricultural update. So let's go ahead and do <laughs> <laughs> space weather news. Less mud in space. From spaceweather.com. All quiet alert. Yesterday's weak CME impact barely disturbed Earth's magnetic field. Today, quiet has resumed. No geomagnetic storms are expected for the next three days. And also, there's an article here on noctilucent cloud season that is getting longer. Uh, NLC season is getting longer. New data from NASA's AIM spacecraft show the first NLCs of summer have been trending earlier since the spacecraft was launched in 2007. Interestingly, the season is not also ending later. It still stops in August. Nevertheless, the early start is giving Skywatchers an extra five days a year of noctilucent clouds. Uh, in recent years, NLCs have spilled as far south as Los Angeles and Las Vegas, setting records for low-latitude sightings. And mid-June to July is when the clouds are most widespread. So observing tip, look west 30-plus minutes after sunset. If you see luminous blue-white tendrils spreading across the sky, you may have spotted a noctilucent cloud. So, man, if it's all, with, all the way to Los Angeles, I wonder if we could see them down into Vegas. Yeah, we should be. Yeah. We should be able to. Um, oh, yeah. What, what, what's the conditions up there? All right. Current conditions. Solar wind speed, 308.7 kilometers per second, and the density is, is 13.5 protons per cubic centimeter. Current sunspot number is 30. Uh, neutron count is 9.3% above the space age average. And KP index is zero right now, which is rated as quiet. And the 24 hour max was three, also quiet. So there you have it. All right. Thank you. So I have this, um, this solar cycle story. It's very long. Uh, but I kind of want to read it. Yeah, I've got a couple of other stories too, but I mean, this is a kind of a long one, and I was thinking maybe I'll put it off, but go for it. Yeah, I think I should go for it. Let's hear it. So this is from space.com, and hopefully I don't get all the pop-ups and stuff that <laughs> mess me up. Um, so apologies in advance if that happens. A solar activity refers to the state of the sun's magnetic field and associated phenomena: sunspots, flares, solar wind, and coronal ejections. During periods of, solar, of minimal solar activity, such events are often uncommon and weak. During solar maximum, they're at their strongest and most frequent. Magnetic field fluctuations on the sun can happen on drastically different timescales, ranging from seconds all the way to billions of years. When astronomers speak of the slowdown or a period of quiescence in the sun's activity, uh, it doesn't mean that the sun will stop shining, but that there's a slowdown in activity. The sun has one particular rhythm lasting approximately 11 years in which its polar magnetic field flips polarity. Sunspots serve as an indicator of this change. Indeed, it's often known as the sunspot cycle. Although sunspots themselves were first observed in detail by Galileo, Christoph Scheiner, and others uh, from 1609 onwards, according to the British Library, the cyclical nature of their appearance and disappearance was first noted in 1775 by Danish astronomer Christian Horeb Horebo. It was then rediscovered in 1843 by Heinrich Schwab. In 1848, Swiss astronomer Rudolf Wolf used Schwab and others' results, as well as performing his own observations, to calculate the 11-year cycle and a mathematical method to count the number of sunspots. This so-called wolf number remains in use today, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Many other astronomers at the time either independently observed this cycle or were inspired by the results of others. 
Wolf's own calculation of the 1755 to 1766 sunspot cycle was labeled as the first, and each sunspot cycle since then has been progressively numbered as such. We are now in cycle 25. But sometimes the spots don't appear at all. This was the case for 80 days of the first six months of the current solar cycle, which started in December 2019. It was greater still for the same period in cycle 24, where there were 281 spot-free days. The period from 1645 to 1715 saw a near total crash in sunspot numbers, where they could literally be counted on two hands. Wolf struggled to piece together solar cycles before the mid-1700s because of this Darth of information. Darth? D uh, Darth? <laughs> uh, but it didn't mean sunspots weren't being observed. Many distinguished astronomers of the age, such as Giovanni Cassini, continued to make observations. This 70-year solar lull was later noted by German astronomer Gustav Sporer, which then later inspired the British-Irish husband and wife team Edward and Annie Maunder. The period has since been named the Maunder Minimum, according to Encyclopedia Britannica. There have been other lulls before and since, such as the Sporer and Dalton minima. However, uh, Ma Madhulika Guttakarta, <laughs> a heliophysicist at NASA speaking in a personal capacity, questioned how the technology available then affected observations. Quote, During the Maunder minimum, when we could when we could not detect any sunspots, the question remains how well could we detect very faint sunspots then or even now? End quote. We don't know and have no measure of that. The uncertainty associated with detecting no sunspots is much harder than counting them during solar maximum. Right? Hmm. So, so during the Maunder minimum, I think is what they're saying is, People were saying there were no sunspots, but other people were still observing them. So, that it, like some people could see them, yeah, some people couldn't. Real small, real small, and like maybe short-lived. Atmospheric, yeah. Okay. Um, so, but during solar maximum, it's a much easier to count, right? Because there's, yeah, you, you may not be worried about such tiny little fluctuations or something. I don't know that's the idea. I got. Or you're missing the small ones during the maximum. Maybe so. Yeah. I was also thinking, yeah. yeah. So in 2020, cycle 25 had 80% more sunspots overall than the equivalent period for cycle 24, suggesting that the current cycle may in fact be stronger rather than weaker. The International Solar Cycle 25 Prediction Panel said in September 2020 that they expect cycle 25 to be about as strong as cycle 24. Has the consensus changed since then, or is it still the same? The consensus has not changed, panel co-chair Doug uh, Bisecker told All About Space, which is, I guess, the name of a show or something, All About Space. Uh, the consensus is still that the current cycle will be much like cycle 24. We have not seen anything that differs significantly in the early stages of this cycle that varies from the panel prediction of a peak of 115 sunspots in July 2025. Uh, huh. Uh, the predictions, okay, so the prediction is a peak of 115 sunspots in July of 2025. Hmm. The predictions are based on the 13-month smoothed sunspot number, a statistical method for calculating sunspots. And you have to be patient when studying the sun. As B. Secker said, quote, it can take up to three years after the cycle begins before we can say with confidence whether the prediction is still valid, end quote. Uh, I gotta figure out how to pronounce this guy's name. Uh, Guhata Kurta believes this cycle <laughs> is not out of the ordinary. Looking at sunspots as a non-physical index of solar activity, I think this solar cycle isn't unusual, especially in the context of the prior cycle. This cycles, uh, this cycles, sort of mimicking that. Even in the early 1800s and 1900s, you see cycles of this magnitude. Uh, he said. So, uh, successfully predicting solar weather is certainly essential when testing scientific theories about how the sun works. But there's a more pressing practical reason for doing so. Strong solar flare events and coronal mass ejections, most likely to occur around the time of solar maxima, can disrupt modern technology. The flux of high-energy particles can damage spacecraft, satellites, and even ground-based power systems. 
The latter are particularly vulnerable as solar radiation easily disturbs Earth's magnetic field, inducing currents in long power lines. Such a geomagnetic storm destroyed large grid transformers and shut down the whole of Quebec, Canada in March 1989, NASA reported. And this was just history repeating itself. In September of 1859, a geomagnetic storm dubbed the Carrington Event caused interesting problems with the telegraph system. Telegraph operators noticed that they could disconnect their batteries and work with just the induced currents from the storm, sometimes with improved results. To this day, it is the most powerful coronal mass ejection on record. If a Carrington-level Carrington event were to happen now, it would cause widespread damage and disruption to power systems and satellites. As well as decimating electronics, any astronauts venturing beyond the protective blanket of Earth's geomagnetic field, such as to the Moon or Mars, would be in danger, something that NASA's upcoming Artemis lunar program needs to keep in mind. Considering the stakes, Coupled with the fact that the sun is such a complex system, there must be another way to glean information about its future behavior besides sunspots. Other tried and trusted methods exist, but there may well be another arrow in the quiver. A U.S. Uh, and U.K. team led by Scott McIntosh of the High Altitude Observatory at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, has looked at a phenomenon related to sunspot activity. <clears throat> So these guys, I think, uh, I talked about this. There was another story we did a while back that these guys were predicting that this may be a really uh, high-energy solar cycle. Yeah. Remember that? Yep. So they have a totally different way of uh, predicting, so they're going to go through that again. Okay. Uh, using data from sources such as NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory, the team looked at extreme ultraviolet and X-ray flashes in the solar corona. These so-called bright points in the sun's atmosphere correlate with large areas of material flowing in the sun's interior, which rotates faster than surface plasma, similar to rates seen for sunspots. Robert Lehman of the University of Maryland likened it to helium balloons being dragged along by weights attached to the bottom. Such a study is potentially more useful than the sunspot cycle as it shows magnetic polarity. In the 19th century, Richard Carrington and Sporer both discovered sunspots appearing at different latitudes during different points in the solar cycle, starting at mid-latitudes and migrating towards the equator at the end. Plotted against time, this leads to a distinctive butterfly diagram. But in the early 20th century, American astronomer George Ellery Hale proved the importance of solar magnetism by showing how a complete polar flip actually spans two sunspot cycles. A flip, then a flip back. According to NASA, this 22-year hail cycle is what McIntosh's team looks at. The bright points are markers of hail cycle magnetic bands. In the graph that I'm not able to see somehow. Mm. <clears throat> this begs the question of why the wider solar scientific community doesn't make for, uh, more use of such observations in this way. Folks have in the past calling them uh, folks have made use of this in the past calling them ephemeral active regions, but predominantly they are locked into the big white whales of solar activity sunspots. Macintosh said, just like sunspots, the magnetic bands travel the latitudes of the sun to meet at the equator, annihilating in what Macintosh calls termination events. Remember this? Yeah. So yeah, they start at the higher latitudes. The sunspots do. And they're moving down, and then when, when they get to the equatorial region, they, they annihilate. But the, the sunspots are driven by those magnetic field bands. Yeah. So their secondary effects is basically what the Macintosh team is saying. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so Macintosh's team uses these termination events to identify complete 22-year magnetic cycles, as well as the 11-year sunspot cycles of the past. Using these alongside predictions made for a 2020 Terminator event, the team predicts that Solar Cycle 25 will, in fact, be strong. In marked contrast to scientific consensus, they say it will be among the strongest ever recorded. Okay, so we have a we have a test coming up of the two methods. That's right. Nice. Cause the, yeah, because the Sunspot guys are like, this is going to be weak. Or the, it's going to be the same as last year, or, or the last yeah, one. And yeah, the, and... Okay, well, let's let, let me finish okay, the story. Right. Uh, B. Secker is supportive of the team's approach. 
Quote, the work from Macintosh et al. is very intriguing. It would be very exciting to have their prediction come true as it would help teach us about how to better predict future solar cycles, end quote. But he does have a caveat. The Macintosh technique has yet to make a true prediction. That is, one for which there is no knowledge of the future. It's very difficult for a panel to give much weight to a technique that is new, which has never made a prediction that can be tested. Uh, he says other more traditional methods continue to be used as they have been have been successful in the past and are better known. So if Macintosh's study is right, however, what could it say about the solar interior? That the magnetic systems inside the sun are much stronger than we anticipate and that they interact strongly to shape the production of spots uh, is what Macintosh says. The pressure of the magnetic field band relative to the surroundings is important. Uh, and Macintosh says, my sense is that the sun really wants to be balanced and that we see in terms of sunspots and what we see in terms of sunspots is the result of imbalance in that pressure globally locally and longitudinally. This means they think they're only seeing the tip of the iceberg where the magnetic field is concerned. I think that's not a very good uh, <laughs> the tip, tip of the, of the iceberg. iceberg on the sun. <laughs> <laughs> Who is this writer? <laughs> Macintosh also said that the recurrence of 55 degree latitude bands in their analysis, which it's a can... firebird. It's the tip <laughs> yeah. of the firebird. <laughs> <laughs> Firebergs. <laughs> Macintosh also said that the recurrence of 55 degree latitude bands in their analysis, which can be traced back through the entire observational and photographic record, is very overlooked. It suggests structural or geometric features that play a significant role in forming and aggregating the magnetic field in the sun's interior. There are still many open questions, but is the team's approach bearing out for space weather forecasting? As Lehman says, it's too early to tell, but so far the observed sunspot number and other measures such as F10.7 solar radio flux, which I guess is 10.7, okay, 10.7 centimeter wavelength radio waves, are tracking closer to our higher predictions rather than the lower panel consensus. I don't know what he means by that. Whatever. Oh, he's saying, based on those waves, their their prediction is more right than the yes, other one. Yes, right. Yeah. Whatever happens with the sunspot level, there will be some big storms, and our technological society will be impacted in some way or another during solar cycle 25. Macintosh concurred, saying, indications are that it's on track to be bigger than 24 and likely 23 as well. But we really need the termination event to happen to get real fidelity on the forecast. Macintosh is still convinced that it'll be a larger than average cycle, perhaps even in the top 10 of every one on record. But until that event happens, we won't know for sure. B Secker's looking further. B Secker is looking further ahead, saying, the relevance of the Hale cycle, as detailed in Macintosh et al., will be something for Solar Cycle 26 panel to consider. He points out that looking at the 22-year Hale cycle isn't new to forecasting, and that scientists have looked at the effects of odd and even cycles in the past, although with less skill than looking at precursors of the next immediate cycle. He says, expect the Macintosh technique to be a big part of the conversation when the panel to forecast solar cycle 26 convenes. Uh, future technology could also pave the way for a better understanding of solar activity, according to, uh, how did I say it? Guhitakurta. <laughs> <laughs> I spent the last four years at NASA Ames Research Center shaping a program called Frontier Development Lab and got fascinated by artificial intelligence and how we might utilize our data and the tools of AI to infer patterns that can better guide physics outcomes. Uh, machine learning and AI could be critical for understanding solar, solar variability and climate with huge amounts of data. So that's, that's the end of the story. I think it's really cool. This is kind of, I, I wish there was like a, you know, a, a solar Randall out there that was like, just like digging through all these papers and telling us about it every week. Yeah. Because these guys are writing papers and they got these varying theories. And well, you know. uh, yeah. So suspicious observers does that 
pretty well. Oh yeah. Okay, those are the guys. And those are daily updates. And so you, That's if true. you if you want if you want like really cool sun related uh information, you know, 10 minutes a day. He posts some That's really right. really That's right. Yeah, boring. I have checked them out. They're they're pretty cool. Yeah, they're good. Uh so the the, the weird thing is the the headline of this of this story is called "Is Our Sun Going Into Hibernation?" <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, "What?" <laughs> I want to know if the odd cycles or the even cycles are the ones that I want to know which ones are the ones that are in line with Earth's magnetic polarity. Because that's a big po- so like if if so, let's see if I can. Well, look you up. have you have. I see what you're saying. Yeah, because you'll have two. Well, they're both in a way because the two bands, the band coming from the north, its southern part, say, might be is positive, right? Mm -hmm. That's the positive polarity of its southern part of the band. The northern part of the band is a negative polarity. Yeah. I think. Okay. Right? Because the band is positive. So it's not a simple polarity like the earth has it. It goes along the axis. Well, that's the way they annihilate, right? And then the band in the southern hemisphere that's coming north. Its northern part is positive, so the yeah. two positives hit each other and annihilate. Hmm. Okay. No, positive no. and negative. It has to be positive. Okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Dang it. Yeah, because the positive, yeah. the positives one, if they were both positive, they yeah, would they would they would reinforce. That's yeah. right. So yeah, they are. You're right. So then the one band on the northern hemisphere will be positive, the band on the southern hemisphere will be negative, and then they annihilate, and then the next two, the northern hemisphere band will be negative, and the yeah. bottom. So that so it and is. And so you can look at it as an axial, yes, like north axial, and south. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Okay. And so I'm wondering because because when the polarity of the sun of the cycle is the same as the polarity of the Earth. In other words, if the sun's north pole is also if the sun's north side upper part is also the north pole like the Earth's. Yeah, is, yeah. I understand what you're saying. Then yeah. it lines up with the Earth's magnetic field and it's easier for these events to penetrate our field because everything's huh. in line. Whereas when it's reversed, Earth's magnetic field acts as a better buffer against large events because they're they're reversed and it's a, it's able to actually Annihilate it. Yeah, it's actually able to to yeah because they the 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 charge comes out and it goes around. It doesn't doesn't match up. Can't fit through the field. You know they've yeah. they've d- described it in multiple ways where it's like it's lined up with the field and so it's able to pass through it better. More energy is able to pass through the field when they're lined up. So I'm wondering, is it odd cycles or even ones where it's lined up? I bet it's even ones. Hmm. I'm just guessing, but I don't know. We don't have the watcher yet. Maybe he can find out. Well, you should pick one. I should just yeah, just pick one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was suggesting that odd ones are where it's not lined up. All right. Yeah. Cool. I mean, that makes sense to me, but it just depends on when they started counting, really, right? Yeah, I guess so. Or may yeah, maybe they consider the polarity Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't mean, know in what... my mind I'm like when the numbers are even, that's when it lines up because everything's even. Okay. And yeah. when and when it's odd is when it's opposed, right? I just don't know if that's how they set it up. Yeah. So. But yeah, it's interesting. So if we do get a stronger cycle, and it is lined up with the Earth's magnetic field, then it then it, the, there's potential for I, more damage. I just think there's a lot. I, I I like the way this this Macintosh et al. team is approaching the whole thing. Right. Yeah. I'm glad they're making predictions and it's something that we will be able to see play out. I yeah. like their approach because their main point is it's really hard to count sunspots in solar minimum. Yeah. So for most I mean, you know, for at least half of the time you don't really know what's going on. See, so it's hard to pinpoint you know when the beginning and the end of a cycle is. Oh yeah, because they're tiny or or whatever. Yeah, yeah. and so there that was their whole point in the last story that I read hmm. that they were like that when you look at the the solar cycles that have been documented, they're this idea of an eleven year cycle is really whack. It's like way off of that. It's you know on average they can figure well it's roughly eleven years. Okay, yeah, because it's so hard to pinpoint. Based on the solar yeah, minimum I, sunspots. I remember that when we were going through, you know, space for the news and there's just no spots, yeah, no yeah. spots. And then suddenly a spot would appear and he would say, and this is one that appears to be from 25 because yeah. its polarity is reversed. Right. So it's cool that they're, you know, they're trying to look at it from a magnetic uh, perspective. 
And, so wait, uh, are you telling me that like electromagnetism might have a big part to play in the the way the sun works? Yeah, I mean that's what these guys are saying. Wow. Someone should uh, come up with a theory about that. Maybe they're working on it. Like somebody should be. It'll be the first time ever. Yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, the other interesting thing was that talking about the, like, the accelerated motion of the inter interior of the sun. Yeah, that it rotates. And how it's like, it's like a weight dragging these, like, helium balloons around, which is yeah. the sunspot, right? Right, yeah. The sunspot's lagging behind yeah. the interior rotation. So it's cool. I don't, I don't know. I found that yeah. pretty interesting. So we get to see uh, if they actually come up with a solid theory for... Um, how the universe works based on this. <laughs> uh, and then I got a couple of other shorter things. A mystery chunk of ice crashes through a Wisconsin family's roof. Ho! Oh. A Wisconsin man received an unusual wake-up call when a nearly 13-pound chunk of ice crashed through the ceiling of his bedroom. Ken Millerman said he was in bed at his family's Elk Mound home when the 12.6-pound chunk of ice crashed through the roof and into his bedroom. It grazed me, Millerman told <laughs> a WQOW-TV. The homeowner said he would have probably been out, kicked the bucket, <laughs> if the ice chunk had landed just inches away from where it fell. He compared the sound of the crash to a shotgun blast. The origin of the ice chunk is a mystery. The National Weather Service in uh, some place in Minnesota said the storm clouds in the area Tuesday morning were not strong enough to cause hail the size of that ice chunk. Hey, this is some 40 and stuff right here. The ice chunk fell from the sky just under a, a week, one week, after a Florida man or a Florida family had a similar experience. The Martin County Sheriff's Office said that a large chunk of ice crashed through the roof of a Palm City home on the morning of May 19th. What? One week prior. <laughs> and that one was, I looked it up, I can't remember. It was not 12 pounds. It was more like four or five pounds. So still. And it was the same deal. Yeah. Like they're like, there's, there's no storms. No way to, there was nothing up there that could have caused this. And then, you know, the scripts are out there Someone like, Someone called Charles. <laughs> yeah. It was a plane. It was, it was ice a plane. on a yeah. plane. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting tired of all these chunks of ice and all these plates. But then uh, when I actually went and looked up large chunks of ice falling from the sky, there's quite there's quite a few. Yeah, it happens. Yeah, right and there's one with a video of these guys walking in this giant boulder-sized chunk of ice just bam hits the Whoa. ground in the city. Just like and everybody's like, oh. <laughs> so yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, uh, in the Book of the Damned, a fort says he he found a report of one. And he said it was the size of an elephant. Oh my gosh! Yeah, largest one he found. Yeah, iceberg falls from the sky. Yeah, yeah. All right, last thing I got, and uh, no, I'm sorry we're going late here. It's all right. Uh, this is from Smart News, Smithsonian Magazine. Water bears can survive impact speeds of 1,845 miles per hour. Whoa. Tardigrades. Yeah. Yeah, basically these guys set up a a lab experiment, uh, experiment where they were firing the tardigrades out at a and <laughs> in, 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 in simulating impacts and yeah. basically found So you cover the the bullet with them and shoot it out or something? <laughs> I guess. They loaded microscopic beings into a gun <laughs> and fired them at sandbag targets to test their impact survival rate. According to a study published in Man, I wanted to come up with a really witty name for this <laughs> <laughs> this journal, <laughs> but it didn't happen. <laughs> Astrobiology. It turns out tardigrades can survive the violent impacts, but only to a certain point before they begin to fall apart. It could be the first step in exploring whether life can be distributed to other planets via asteroids. There you go. If the impact doesn't kill the life form first. So I thought that was really cool. Wow. Yeah, I think I saw that article going around. Yeah, well, I saw it going around, and I snacked it. You snagged it. Snagged it. That's cool. I bet uh, old Wick Ramasinghe got that one, too. Yeah, he, yeah I'm sure. Yeah. You're going to have to change their names. They're definitely not tardy. <laughs> Hardy grades. <laughs> Hardy grades. There you go. That's good. <laughs> All right, well, before we take the break, we got the crypto update here. Bitcoin is at $37,752.06. And Ethereum is at $2,734. <laughs>
<laughs> I'm still doing good. <laughs> My portfolio is fine. <laughs> I mean, it has dropped, but I'm definitely not in the red. I'm not in the red yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. We'll be right back. That's right. Just getting something really wrong on the show. <laughs> just for the hell of it. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, folks. Uh, Brothers of the Serpent Podcast. And uh, we got a very special episode today. Yep. Which is um, listener communications, which we haven't done in a while. That's right. And But first, we're going to talk about UFOs here. Oh, I thought we were doing that last. No, we're going to do it now. <laughs> See? <laughs> Making I just did it again. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I figure we'll we'll do this first, and then the rest of the show will be the listener communications. Because uh, I don't know how long this is going to go. Probably not long. Uh, first, first thing I want to say is, I read the new valet book, Trinity. Uh, so there's there's some doubts about whether or not this is the book he intended to publish because. It's uh, it was kind of weird. It was like he was going to publish, and then suddenly, it was like the book was pulled, and the name was changed, the art was changed, and a co-author was added. And uh, so there was people wondering, sort of, you know, it was kind of going around. People were wondering if there's so that he's trying to do something in concert with what people feel like is a sort of a disclosure thing that's happening right now with, uh, with the Pentagon and UFOs and the ATIP program and, uh, all these videos that have been coming out, the stuff that's been happening basically since around 2017. Uh, I guess people are putting the marker on it as 2017 cause that's when the first New York times article came out that sort of brought this back out into the mainstream. Now I say, you know, uh, people are saying, Oh, it's out in the mainstream. It's been in the mainstream many, many times throughout history throughout the history of, of the modern UFO thing, it, and it sinks back away. But plenty of times in the history of this, it, mainstream has taken it seriously. But it always goes back into the chuckles and cue the X-Files music style treatment eventually. So this is just a new wave of mainstream treating it seriously in concert with what's happening with people discovering that the government has been taking it seriously, which I'm sure they've been taking it seriously the whole time, but it's been hidden for the most part. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back to that with the with stuff that's happening with that. But anyway, the valet book I read, and I was, number one, I, I, to me, Jacques Vallée really is my go-to source for the UFO stuff because I feel like he approaches it the right way. Uh, I'm not saying that other people are wrong in their approach, but I really, maybe I should say what I like is I like his approach. Uh, and his approach is kind of how we try to approach things here on Brothers of the Serpent, which is you start from, uh, you start from an understanding of your total ignorance, <laughs> you know, and Valet is basically like, look, you can't, we can't even, you know, what, what's, what people call the ETH, the extraterrestrial hypothesis, he's like, that's that's taking it steps too far. Uh, we don't actually know what this phenomenon is. All we've been able to identify is that there's something happening, and it seems to have a physical component, but it also has a psychic or psychological component uh, and a consciousness component, and po possibly all three of those things are the same thing, but they're terms that are... Uh, they're, they're separate terms, but they're try they're sort of trying to describe the same thing. And another component may be what could be described as spiritual because it changes people permanently. Uh, and that's an so that's another thing I'll come back to. So for now, let's talk about the new book Trinity. First, I want to say that that's the way I look at the 411 thing, too. Yeah. It's just like I'm not ready to jump to the conclusion that there's like 
creatures out there snagging people. Absolutely. But there's definitely something yeah. strange. Something is going happening. on. Yeah. yeah. I agree. I agree. You can't uh, you can't say creatures. And I'm not even going to say that all of those cases are connected, right? Yeah. Like same with the UFO phenomenon. Right. It's like maybe these aren't actually all connected. Yeah. Absolutely. I don't know. But there is something strange. Definitely. Yes. Absolutely. Uh <clears throat> So the new book is a in-depth case study of one particular case and this isn't necessarily so I was asked by people, you know, like any new revelations in there. And I was like, to me, yes, because I had never heard of this case, but I'm not nearly as well read as some people are on the UFO subject. Uh, I do understand that books have been previously published about this particular case. Those books were published by the person who became the co-author of this new book. Uh, Paula Harris, I think is her name. Um, so to me, when I was reading the book, it became clear to me why she was added as a co-author and I'm not clear I'm not sure why she wasn't and this is part of why people think this is not the same book. Um but a lot of the material in the book at least in the first half I would say is material from Harris's earlier interviews with these people about this case. Uh so Valet is pulling from that material extensively. Then they lead into new material that he does in concert with Harris in interviewing these people, asking further questions, trying to clarify the original story. They also find a new witness, which is, as far as I can tell, those interviews have never been published before. They're brand new. And, and they were doing this work all the way up until 2020. I mean, in the book, he talks about the, you know, the lockdowns and stuff impeding their, pro their progress. Uh, so it's recent work, very recent. But the premise here is, is that there were a couple of kids in 1945. So this would be, um, I'm not going to get the dates exactly right, but basically, and they were from San Antonio, New Mexico, which to me is like a weird, like a bit of a synchronicity-ish <laughs> But San Antonio, New Mexico is a tiny, tiny place. It's like you can't even really describe it as a town. It's it's got like uh, it, it has like a, a one stop grocery store slash bar slash, you know, I mean, there's one place that's the business in town where everybody goes. And that's and it, and it is everything except the bank, probably. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> basically all the businesses in one. Uh, but it was very near the Manhattan Project sites. And this is why the book is called Trinity, because the place where they detonated the first test bomb was the Trinity site. Uh, so San Antonio, New Mexico is like 20 miles ish from that area. So some of the book is detailing that because this case takes place within a month of that detonation, two weeks after the after the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Um. So there's some hints in there about, you know, the idea that the modern UFO stuff began with us detonating nuclear weapons. Uh, now, I know from all of Jacques' previous work that he doesn't necessarily agree with this, that he thinks this phenomenon is much older. But nevertheless, uh, these detonations and the nuclear stuff do seem to interest this phenomenon, whatever it is. But the gist, so the gist of the story is this. Two boys, one of them was seven and one of them was nine. Uh, and these are like, uh, they're the, the families that live in San Antonio, in San Antonio, New Mexico at the time. This was a tiny town of maybe, you know, it was like they described it as being five or six families total. Now the families are huge, right? But still, it's just a small number of people, enormous amounts of land, desert, scrublands. And they're all ranchers and farmers. So these two boys were sent and they're not these two boys are fr best friends, but they're not from the same family, but they're from neighboring ranches. So the seven year old is the one that lives on the ranch that this took place on. And the nine year old comes over early in the morning and they saddle up their horses and they from the at the father's instruction, they go out to look for a, a cow that they knew was calving that was giving birth. He's like, what? Ride the fences. Go find her. She's out there somewhere. Make sure she's OK. Make sure the calf is OK. You know, 
and then keep riding the fences and counting and counting cattle. So these kids, they had binoculars and they were well acquainted with the, the, the terrain. They rode these fences all the time. They knew all the gullies and all the, you know, the places like it kind of describes like how they, they were very intimate with the land and they did this all the time and they were, uh, uh, and they knew their way around. So they go out there, they find the cow, and they make sure she's okay. A storm rolls in. And so they take shelter in like an overhang, you know, uh, in, uh, like a like a rock overhang. It's not a cave, not quite, but it's a like a, a shelter under a, an overhang of a rock. And uh, the storm kind of passes, uh, and there was some thunder and lightning in the storm. And then they hear like a really large boom like an explosion sound as they're coming out um and there's a flash of light and all this stuff and they basically see something smoking <laughs> through the sky you know after the boom and the flash of light they see something and they're like something's going down and they think it might be a plane it's not it, it looks like it's been damaged it's smoking and they see it go down over uh, over the top of a hill and they hear it impact and uh, they are immediately like, well, we better go check and see if anybody needs any help. Okay. So they make their way over there. And, of course, there's there's smoke and whatever the crash is, it sets stuff on fire. And they describe, you know, they describe it as the mesquite is burning and it's real smoky. And, I mean, we burn mesquite. It makes a lot of smoke. And uh, so there's they're, they're, they're having to be careful. And they have to leave the horses behind because the horses are freaking out. But... They find a long trough in the ground, like it carved this pathway, and then there's a sharp turn as it like it was going down a like basically an arroyo or a canyon, and it uh, makes a sharp turn at the end. And when they come around the turn, there's all this smoke, and they're coughing, and they can't really see very well. But eventually, the smoke clears, and they see this craft, and the craft appears basically undamaged, except for there's a hole in the side of it, and they describe the hole as being symmetrical, like uh, it may not have been damaged from the impact or the crash itself but but actually a door that was open they describe it as an avocado shape that was flattened okay uh and they see beings three of them outside the craft which they de they describe in multiple ways they call them little men hombrecitos hombrecitos right little men uh, they give it another name of, uh, I'm going to butcher these, but there's, they have another Spanish name for what basically translates as to praying mantis. They also refer to them occasionally as, uh, Nino de la Tierra, which is a colloquial, colloquial, colloquial name for what's called a Jerusalem cricket, which is a gigantic, uh, cricket. Uh, but I looked up the. I was looking at that and I was like, this, you know, I looked up the Sounds like of the mountain child of the earth, child of the what earth, it translates yeah. to literally. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Tierra. Yeah. yeah. Nino de la Tierra, uh, child of the earth. <clears throat> so they, they said that they, you know, and remember this is a seven year old and a nine year old. Okay. So immediately people have already said, well, these, these were kids. They're being interviewed when they're in their seventies. You know, so people are like, do they really have good memories of this? I don't know what to say to that. I feel like uh, I have memories when I was that young of impactful things that took place. And I have recounted them to like, you know, the, the snake parents and said, is this a clear memory of what I, I'm like? I remember this thing. It impacted me. And this is what I remember. And they're like, yeah, that's what happened. Like, so you do have, you know, you can have clear memories of when you're that young of things that were very that that had a strong effect on you. Now, I don't know, you know, the story can change over time. There's all kinds of people have criticized this, this concept of their, you know, these people are, these men are in their seventies and eighties and they're getting all these details from them about what took place. But both of them make it clear that they remember these things very clearly. Now, the question is, is how, you know, has their memories changed? But so without going into all the detail, but there's a lot of detail in the book, but they basically they see these beings. They feel like the and there's there's some interesting descriptions of the, they feel like the beings are uh, uh, upset or in trouble. They seem to be making noises and both of them feel immediately like they're not scared, but they, they feel frozen in place. These are classic problems uh, with UFO encounters. They, they feel paralyzed. They can't move. They start having pictures in their heads 
And the pictures they describe as being, they're like, it was like, it was a catastrophe or whatever. So you kind of get the idea that the beings are out there running around like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, we just crashed. And the boys are getting a telepathic sort of thing in their head. Like they've, there's just been a catastrophe, right? So it's like, they're getting like a bleed over of what these beings are feeling. I don't know. That's how I took it. Uh, they actually stay out there for a couple of hours watching what's going on. But and one of them, the nine year old wants to go to them. And he's like, let's go to them. Let's go help. The seven year old's a little too afraid and he doesn't want to go. So the nine year old doesn't go. He, he won't leave his, his yeah. friend. Then they leave and they go and they tell the seven year old's father, the one who owns the calf, the, the cow that they went to look for. That there was a crash. They don't really tell him the details of like the telepathy or, you know, they don't tell him all that stuff. They're just like, look, something crashed uh, out there. And so he gets a hold of the police and the next day they go out or maybe it was two days later. I'm not sure. But he gets a cop from the town and they go out there. The boys take them out there to show them where the crash was. When they get back out there, the smoke is all gone. There's still the big trough. The craft is still there. There's still debris all over the ground. There's like weird metal pieces and other things all over the ground. <laughs> What? <laughs> what? I just... Man, I really messed that up. The guacamole was all over the ground. <laughs> I just... I started was, laughing before was, I could say it. was guacamole everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when an avocado crashes, yeah. you get guacamole. You do get a lot of guacamole. Uh, so, the... But the beings are gone. Okay. And they never see the beings again. They only saw them that first time. Uh, but the father and the policeman go inside the craft. They tell the boys, wait here, and they go inside. And the boys say that, that both both witnesses, who are now old men, are telling this story. They both say that they stood there for a long, what seemed like a really long time while um, while the father and the and the policeman were inside the craft. And by the way, the, th the craft wasn't enormous. It, you know... Think 30, 40, maybe 30 or 40 feet long. Okay, 15 or fifteen or 20 feet tall. You know, it's not huge. Um, but yeah, they entered the craft in the hole in the side of it, which was square. Uh, so they were wondering if it was a panel that broke off when the thing hit, or it, in other words, it wasn't like a damaged hole. It, it was a door, basically. But when the father and the policeman came out, they said that they, both of them described it as like, Something happened to them. They both looked like different men, like they they had a experience or something. Um, but from that, they they leave, and then I guess the policeman notifies the military because you have to remember again the context here is that this whole town is used to the Manhattan Project being nearby. They don't know what it is. They just know it's a top. But they must have witnessed. The explosion. They least. did, yeah. yeah. And it, it actually, um, the one of their mothers was blinded in one eye. Oh, my gosh. Because she... It's terrible. Yeah, she looked, you know, it was described as like... They're looking right at it, basically. Yeah, through through a crack. Because, you know, it starts to light up the sky, and they're, they're looking at it through a crack in, in the door or something like that, and that eye is gets blinded. Oh, my gosh. Um, yeah, no, she never recovered from that. And one of the kids also was... They all had eye problems after that. And, of course, it scattered nuclear material everywhere. And, you know, uh, this is why later on when they uh, – because that bomb was detonated like 150 feet above the, the ground, which is why they later changed it. When you drop them, they blow up way up in the sky. And it doesn't cause the, – the, the fallout goes away, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't scatter it everywhere and irradiate everything. Anyway, uh so yeah, they're used to, so they, they, they're thinking maybe it's a military thing, I guess. I don't know. I don't know. But they notify the military and then the army comes out there and it's just like a, first it's just a Jeep and the, they take them to the crash site and it's a couple of guy, army guys, like a colonel and one other, like a grunt driving and they take them out there. And then they leave and then they come back later and they're, they're telling the father, like, look, we need to take your fence down over here. Um, we need to build a road, uh, you know, because it's in a remote area. He's like, we need to build a road. We got to get a truck in there to get this thing out of there. And he tells him it's a, a weather balloon. I mean, it's a classic. Yeah. But the, the thing is, is these farmers have picked up weather balloon. They know what weather balloons look like because they pick them up on their land all the time because the army was putting up weather balloons. 
So they know what weather balloons are. <laughs> that thing's not a weather balloon, right? So they knew that. But the and and if if it's a weather balloon, why do you need a you know a full size forty foot trailer truck on it with a tractor yeah. trailer to carry it out? They just fold it up and stick it in the back of the jeep. But anyway, the boys, the two boys, start going out there and watching over the next two weeks as the army guys. They send like a detachment of soldiers. Nobody's in hazmat suits. It's like not like the movies. You know, nobody's. They don't have any procedure for this. Right. They, it's clear they just send a, t- a detachment of young soldiers. These guys are like 18, 19, 20. They don't know what is going on. They were just clearly they were told to go out there and clean up this mess and get this thing on the truck. Right. So they're out there just in normal army clothes, just working on this thing. Nobody's taking any precautions. And they, it's, they start they start. They're picking up the, the crash material and actually throwing it into a ditch nearby, and then they cover it over in dirt because they don't want to pick all the they don't want to load all that stuff up on the truck, oh, right? <laughs> Meanwhile, the boys are picking up stuff in secret and they're watching the 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 process. So the two witnesses that are being interviewed decades and decades later are talking about how they were they would go up there and they're hiding. You know, there's two little kids, so they're hiding up on these. They know where to hide exactly to watch the whole process. And they've got they've got their binoculars and they're watching these guys and they eventually put up a thing and they lift the thing up onto a back of a truck, put a tarp over it, and take off with it. So the the the, the, the style of the story is that two years before Roswell, the army under the under the aegis of the Atomic Energy Commission recovered a crashed vehicle. Of unknown it kind of origin. sounds like the thing that, uh, um, man, I always forget this guy's name. He's on Joe Rogan talking about working on uh, reverse engineering. Lazar. Yeah. He yeah. talked about going into some rounded metal craft or something like that. Yeah. And like it was all smooth on the interior. There yeah. were no rivets. And you know what I mean? That's yeah. kind of like the image I have in my head of this. Yes. Flattened avocado. They said it was silvery and smooth. Yeah. No rivets were visible. Uh, sounds like the thing he talked about working on. Yeah. Yeah, and Lazar described that there were like what seven or nine crafts in there in the hangar that he was at, S four. But yeah, so these so and then this there's there's other like stories all around this, the the angel hair thing where the the stuff was all over the county. Uh, you know what angel hair is? Have you heard no, of that? No. Okay, it's like okay, it's like um, it's pretty it's fairly common in in uh, in UFO sightings. Um. It looks like a f- like think cobwebs, fibrous mm-hmm. material, and it and like the UFO will be seen to like s- spew this stuff out, and then it like floats down. It's very lightweight, and it lands all over. Can you eat it? <laughs> 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 I don't think so. In yeah. some cases, in some stories, it just dissipates. It like it evaporates. Well, yeah. I mean, obviously, you know what I'm thinking about, right? Yeah, cotton candy. No. About cotton candy? No. Space ramen. Like. Space ramen? <laughs> yeah. Manna. <laughs> yeah. Manna. It dissipates. Yeah. You only collect what you need that day. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It could be space it could be space ramen. Yeah. But this stuff wasn't. It was different All right. than the than the other reports of angel hair that like evaporates. This stuff stuck stuck around for a long time and they were picking it up. They filled up sacks of it. Hmm. And it, it also like was described as being very irritating to your hands. It would like you would play with it and your fingertips would tingle or whatever. And then after a while, you'd find out you have all these little cuts and stuff on the tips oh, of your man. finger. You know, wow. like it's like very thin. It's like fiber optics or something, glass shards or, or, or uh, asbestos, you know, like some kind of insulation. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Fibrous installation, insulation. So, and it's funny because they're telling the stories about how they picked up so much of it and then people use it as Christmas decorations <laughs> because, you know, this is before nobody had power and they didn't have lights, but you, they could hang it on the trees and it was this beautiful, it would like, when you Shimmering looked at it, mover, it would shimmer in different colors and stuff. Oh, that's cool. Uh, people were, they were saying that people were putting it in their windows to look like frost. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they gave, they actually gave it out. There was so much of it. They collected so much that they were just giving it to their neighbors. Like, yeah, look at this cool Christmas decoration stuff that came <laughs> out of that freaking UFO. Uh, <laughs> <That's> weird, <man. laughs> and some of the book details the search for artifacts. So pieces of this thing went everywhere. And the army did a, like a kind of a lousy cleanup job. But there's other, you know, 
There's other aspects of it, like the weird Bureau of Land Management comes in and, and they keep changing the area where the, the crash was. You know, it's like somebody is still aware that this happened a long time ago and they're and they're still like over time, they're still working on like, let's make sure that this is totally covered up. Like they eventually a dozer comes in and completely changes the entire landscape and leaves it to where the, the, the ground level where the saucer crashed is like 20 feet below ground. Uh, and then they plant poisonous plants over the area, like all these non-native, very poisonous plants that give people like really bad uh, allergic reactions are planted in the area. And, and in the book are pictures like where right in the area where the saucer or whatever that the craft was crashed. There's this just this circle of orange and yellow plants that are re really poisonous, just planted right there. Well, that tells you where it was. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. But yeah, you can't go in there, though. With a dozer, you can. Yeah, but it's BLM stuff, and a B uh, Bureau of Land Management. You have to get all these permits to get any equipment out there. Because, yeah, they talked about, like, you know, if with a backhoe, we could dig down into that, where the Army threw all that material if they didn't dig it back out of there. But you'd have to get permits from Bureau of Land Management to take any equipment in there. Night dozen. <laughs> Night dozen. <laughs> anyway, I found the book interesting. He compares it to... Uh, he compares it to... The Lonnie Zamora incident, which happened not too far away uh, in New Mexico, and of course Roswell, which is also not very far away. So Roswell was another crash of something uh, with very similar described materials, memory memory metal. You know, the, the, like plenty of the, the witnesses were describing that there were these foil-like pieces of this thing, and you could crumple them up, and when you let it go, it would unfold and flatten itself out. Hmm. Um. And apparently families around there were picking up pieces of it for years. You know, they'd go out and like one girl was describing how her father would go out and when he'd come back, he'd have a piece of spaceship metal and they had him sitting around their house. You know, of course, nobody has the houses anymore and nobody knows that have, has any of the metal pieces anymore because, you know, they didn't know they were important. Yeah. So part of the book details them trying to track down any remnants of the of the craft. The only one they end up finding is one that the boys actually broke out of there right before the army took it away. And they're pretty sure that it was a bracket that the army installed in order to lift the thing because there was just a pin that they were able to pop out with a crowbar. But it actually wasn't part of the craft itself. And they do testing on it. And they find out it's like it's an interesting aluminum alloy, but it was nothing that couldn't be made in the in the time period. And when you look, they have a picture of it and you can see it's it looks like a, a regular uh, like a machined bracket. Hmm. So, but yeah, no other, no other crash materials from that crash. So anyway, the book was very interesting. I do recommend reading it. It's it. I, I thought for a while I was like, what is, what is Valet doing here? Like he's like, suddenly he's going full nuts and bolts. Let's chase down crashed, crashed flying saucers. Cause that's very much out of character with his previous re re research. But <clears throat> as I read the book, I, came to understand that like, no, he's just, he is doing the kind of, he's like, he's following up on this story that apparently has like, he's like, there is a way to follow up on this, you know? Yeah. So it's part of the phenomenon, you know, he's still not, he wasn't going full nuts and bolts, but he's like, yes, if there are physical traces, let's have them analyzed, you know? So that led me to, and I know I'm going long here, but that led me to, uh, should we take a break and come back or? Like, sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, we went long on the first segment, so that yeah, oh. we can take a break. Doesn't matter. Okay, yeah, because we didn't. didn't. Segway. Segway. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back. Okay. We are back, ladies and gentlemen, Brothers of the Serpent podcast, second hour, and uh, still talking UFOs here. So I want to step away from the latest book, Trinity, uh, which I just tried to give, like, I tried to give a brief overview, and I, it turned out not to be brief. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, good book, though. Go get it. I do recommend reading it. Um, 
But so, you know, that in combination with all this other stuff that's happening right now in the news with UFOs, I started poking around in forums. I just wanted to see, you know, in the UFO forums, uh, various ones. Uh, take the temperature. Yeah, I wanted to take the temperature of uh, people who talk about this stuff and see what they're saying about what's happening. See how they feel about it. Um, there's a lot of... <laughs> there's a lot... I'm. There's a lot of kind of this I told you so attitude that the, you know, the longtime UFO believers have had or that longtime UFO believers are taking right now. They're all like, you know, like they're all like I told you so to all the people that thought they were crazy for looking at this stuff. Now <laughs> yeah. that's in the mainstream news. That's kind of understandable. Um, but I, I do have to say I'm slightly disturbed by how many of them seem to take th and this is you know the, again this is an average not everyone thinks this there are plenty of people who are i feel see this phenomenon as far more nuanced than this but there are a large number of them who are taking this as like friendly space brothers who are coming to save us from ourselves or keep us from destroying the planet or something fighting war you know whatever it is they think and that disturbs me because <laughs> this phenomenon, that's not what this is. Uh, I don't think I, you know, if you can, if you can say, if you can say anything, I don't think that's what this is. Uh, I don't, th I'm not sure we can even take the Space Brothers route. I don't even think we can take the ETH route. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't fully subscribe to the, this all consciousness either. Uh, Again, I like Jacques Vallée's take that it's both, all of those things. It has a definite physical aspect, uh, a technological signature. And yet it seems to affect people's consciousness. It seems to affect them spiritually. Uh, and if you read his work, uh, which I have extensively. Or I'm, there are two very different things that have some similarities. I mean, the nuts and bolts stuff versus the consciousness stuff could be just like totally different things that just ha happen to have similarities across. Well, the problem is that they merge. Like there are there there are people who are drastically changed uh, in a spiritual way in cases where there are where there is physical evidence and radar traces. You know, so it's like, it's both. And it's across, I mean, you can see the patterns. Like, once you start going through all these cases, you the patterns just emerge. And the pattern that emerges is that are, the points I would say are like, it's been here since before the dawn of time. It, it seems to show up in a context that, uh, let's see, a context that, is uh, that is appears to be either aware of the culture in which it's appearing or the culture in which or it's designed such that the culture in which it's appearing is able to imprint its symbols onto it okay so that it appears in a certain way and but that it's always at the edges or just beyond the fringe edge of what that culture understands or is able to deal with you see what i'm saying so it's it's always it's always at the edges in the corners and it's doing this to us. It's doing this to our civilization. And it's, it's like, you see this in the sense that our civilization is treating it as like, well, it's a technological thing. We see them as, we see them as complicated ships that we can't quite build yet, but we, maybe we could get a, uh, maybe we could sort of maybe try to understand how they, how it could take place. You know, whereas in like, for example, in, in the fairy faith in Celtic countries, it's the same phenomenon, but it's appearing to them at the edges of their civilization. They always live in the mountains or in the caves at the sea, the places where no one goes, in the fairy mounds that they know to stay away from, and they're 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 removed from their civil from their culture just enough. They're outside the edges, but they have all these encounters with them. There's abductions, they change people's lives, there's missing time, you know, and you go farther back than that and you see like winged discs. And, you know, the Assyrian stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it, there's always strange beings. I mean, we see it in the carvings and in the stories. And, you know, it's affecting biblical people. They're having the same thing. They're having visions from the sky, wheels in the sky, chariots that are flaming. 
you know, houses that fl that fly, like in the Vedic texts, you mm -hmm. know, it's like the motifs are have the same patterns, but the 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 the, the details of the imagery are different. Now, is that because they were seeing different things, or that's what they are? They just trying to describe the same stuff we're seeing, but they're using their own their own cultural imagery. It isn't clear. Yeah. Like, were they actually seeing winged discs, like discs, like like think flying saucer with wings on it, or is that just how they depicted something that was a disc that was flying in the sky? And you know, a Hura Mazda is sticking out of the top of it, right? So you've got this god being that's clearly coming out of a winged disc in the sky. And then strange astronomical things are happening around it. And then there's like scorpion men guarding a door, you know, in these ancient carvings. And the scorpion men, like, were in Gilgamesh. They're mm -hmm. guarding the entrance to the mountain. Yeah. And often these beings are described as men, but also insects. You know, it's like like in, in modern times, they're like these, these two witnesses. They called them crickets or praying mantises, but also little men. You know, so... It, when you go through Jacques Vallée's work, you see that he, especially if you start with Passport to Magonia, that's what that book was about. He was like, I spent a lot of time in a bunch of libraries looking at very old texts, going back as far as I could, looking for this similar phenomena, looking at mythologies from around the world. And there are similarities, you know, and the, it's the, in Christianity, there's the, the, the strange cloud with the, with the, the, the vision of God and there's the beam of light that comes down and, and suddenly it changes you and you have you have understanding, right? You're yeah. given messages and then you become a prophet. You run down to the city and you start raving about freaking shit in the sky that you just saw. Mm -hmm. And people this is the same thing that happens to UFO people. You know, they they're changed by this experience. So all that said, I feel like what's happening right now in the mainstream is interesting. But they're never, I just don't, I can't imagine that they're going to be able to really <clears throat> do a disclosure on this topic because it isn't as simple as beings from a different star system coming here and looking at us. It is, it's, it's way more complicated and ancient and strange than that. You know, so people who want disclosure, I feel like this whole idea of disclosure is in the one sense, maybe it's a simple thing. All they want is the government to say it is really happening and we don't know what it is. You know, that would be a, that would be a big deal. And that kind of seems to be what's happening in a way. They're saying there are these there are, these sightings are real. They're seen by very credible people and we don't know what they are. But this has happened before. We played a clip on this show of. Of John Sanford saying this thing in a press conference in the 50s. Right. So this isn't a new thing where. Government people are saying, yes, this is a real, they're acknowledging it. Uh, that doesn't turn into disclosure. Now, and, and the other sense is like, does the government really understand what's going on here? And, you know, when I'm, again, I'm poking into the forums and trying to take the temperature of what people think and what they feel about this. That's like half and half. Some people think the government's got it all figured out. Some people think a lot of the stuff that's being seen in modern times is like reverse engineered craft. Some people think that all they need is the government to acknowledge this phenomena is real and we don't know what it is. And that's probably what's going to happen because I don't I'm not sure that the government as a as a large entity or any of the, the visible institutions have any knowledge. Now, are there tiny hidden institutions that are very, very secret that have been studying this since the 40s? If they really picked up that crash thing, maybe do they have they figured anything out about that thing? I don't know. In some cases, you go when you go through Jacques' books and he's talking about the crash things, he's he's wondering, actively wondering if the crashes are intentional. You know, because and again, you have to step back and realize the framework which he's that he's coming from, which is that this entire phenomenon is actually what it is actually seeming to do is it's managing in a large sociological scale the framework of the way humans view the universe. Mm -hmm. And he said, if you if you really pare it all down and you look at it across the ages, what you see is a phenomenon that continues to make human beings believe in a higher power than them. That's all it's been doing all this time. I mean, that's I shouldn't say it that way. That's that's the, the simplest way that you can say that what of what it's been doing. 
It's probably a lot more complicated than that. But across the ages, it seems to have inserted itself into the human consciousness and put into the human consciousness of that time and various other times the idea that there is something out there that is greater than humanity. You know, he's like, this is what this does. Like when you look at the fairy faith, when you look at the Abrahamic religions, when you look at the Assyrian stuff, and the, you know, the Mesopotamian things, and you look at modern UFO things, the, 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 the result is people are going around believing there's something out there that's more advanced than we are. So you could, you could uh, look at the correlation between um, advanced civilizations all throughout the, all throughout history. Yeah. And their religions, right? These big yeah. religions. And is that, it's, you know, I think historians typically look at it like the religions come out of these great civilizations, but you could also look at it in the reverse and say that the great civilization became what it was because yeah, of, of what happened to them, which formed the religious ex beliefs in the beginning. Yeah, exactly. And remember what, and so it was a sort of a sharing of knowledge or yeah, know, something like that, that ultimately resulted in a civilization becoming awesome. Yeah. And I remember what Gobekli Tepe made them change about the way that they viewed the rise of civilizations. They used to say first, the first there was the city and then there was the temple. Yeah. But now, Gobekli now Tepe, now they're the like, no, the first. temple comes first. Yeah. It's the temple. And I started, you know, this is way out there, but I started thinking about how Gobekli Tepe is a bunch of stone circles. And I'm like, those are landing platforms. You know, I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I'm not going full ancient aliens here, but. <laughs> these are guacamole geez. dishes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the triangles are chips. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Avocados and chips, people. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I don't know what to expect from what's going to happen. You know, and most of you who are going to listen to this are going to listen to it after the fact, after this Senate hearing thing that's going to take place in, uh, in June in, uh, this month. Uh, so I'm not going to make any predictions except that I can say that whatever this, whatever's going to take place, it isn't going to be an acknowledgement of how weird this phenomena really is. It, they can't, I don't think that that's possible. It's, you know, maybe people can view it as baby steps, but there are tens of thousands of cases, uh, that, and that's just in the United States. There are many, many more than that from around the world. The one thing about Jock is he has... He has tons of them from France and Brazil, you know, like lots of UFO researchers do look at other cases around the world, but I'll make a prediction. Okay. I think what's going to happen is that a lot more people are going to start reporting sightings. Yeah. Right. Which is probably already happening. It's already happening. Yeah. And that can have a chain reaction. Yeah. But because so many people are going to start coming forward that will go back into the flip side. Yeah. Which is like, oh, my God, all the crazies came out. <laughs> yeah. look, at what, look at what's happened. Right. And they'll just dismiss it as a bunch of quacks. And, and Jacques has this, he has this scaling thing that he does. And nobody's going to want, I'm sorry, nobody's going to want, it, it's like right now you've got this, we've been talking about this, that, that because serious people are looking at this and being public publicly looking at it other serious people are willing to look at it right that was yeah. that's been one of your big points about yes, this whole thing absolutely when all of the crazies come out and start going on shows and reporting and doing all this stuff and i'm i'm saying that from the perspective of this of the of the, of the skeptic people. the serious yeah. nobody's gonna none of the serious people are going to want to be associated with that group right yeah. right, right now it's like oh okay it seems like safe ground Right. So anyway. So you're right. So that's prediction. That's, that's a possibility that because like my prediction is that the disclosure cannot be a full one because it stands too far out. Like like I think that our civilization, at least the Western stuff, you know, in the mainstream or whatever, they're, they're at the point now where they could accept aliens, you know, possibly visiting here. I mean, I think a pe I think a lot of people would be OK with that as long as they aren't dangerous. A lot of physicists would not. Would not be okay with that. That idea, yeah. Because it implies that they're traveling here. Yeah. Yeah. Breaking it, physics. Well, yeah, yeah. Okay. So let's let's take it another way. 
uh, people sending are sending probes. Maybe. Probes. Yeah. yeah. People are talking about it being they're being full AI. Yeah. Partially explaining how they can make these enormous these maneuvers that would tear apart anything inside. But it still doesn't really explain it because some of the maneuvers that they make would tear apart any known material that we have. Right. So the their material science at the very least has to be really good. People are speculating about, you know, the way the craft move. I don't know about any of that, but I think people in general are okay with the idea that there is aliens or at least alien artifacts here. And those people will look at it from the thing of like, this started when we started blowing up nukes, you know, to them, it starts in the, in the forties or fifties, but the phenomena is much older than that and much stranger. And there are plenty of accounts from modern people that are well they're, they're they're well documented and they're not they're not fringe cases this isn't like somebody like i woke up in my bed and or i went to sleep and then i was abducted this is there are there are cases of people disappearing in in you know in view of other witnesses and then being picked up hundreds of miles away a week later having had no idea where they were you know it's like there there are cases yeah. like this Travis Walton is one of them there's plenty of others when you go through the books i can't i can't give a rundown but really when you read when you read Valet's books he just has case after case and he's making his case about this he's trying to show you like let's first understand how strange this phenomena is how often it's this strange how it seems to, he he talks about how it, it it inject it seems to inject absurdity into the experience on purpose. Mm -hmm. You know he's like you look at this account, and at first you're like sounds like a dream. Yeah, at first you're like all right the craft is in this guy. You're like this is, could be technology. The craft lands. All right now we've got landed interesting technology. The alien comes out. Now it's a little strange because the alien's weird. It's a biped. It can talk to us. It doesn't have a helmet. It can breathe our air. You know, and then there's some strange ritual of exchanging of items or it says ridiculous things or it tells the person what are clearly a bunch of lies. Uh, you know, I mean, sometimes they've lied as just as blatantly about what time it is. You know, there's like the what the one alien asks the guy what time it is. He tells him it's two or something. And it's like, you're lying. It's four o'clock. It's definitely not four o'clock. You know, and then it leaves. You're like, what was that about? What, what was the purpose of this? Like, what is the reason and it's it's about injecting, you know, and, and Jock's like, is it is it trying to tell us that time is irrelevant, you know, or is it just injecting absurdity into the experience on purpose for some reason? Like it's it's doing some kind of psychological manipulation, possibly, or who knows? I mean, who knows? But the the encounters are weird and it's like they're weird on purpose. And when you look at large numbers of cases, you can see that the pattern is weird and the and you can you can see patterns emerging from the weirdness you know like one really interesting thing i found was like the the, the lani zamora he sees a, an egg-shaped craft so another it, this is another avocado but it's standing on one end right he mm -hmm. describes it as an egg it lands he sees a couple of beings and they take off but he meanwhile he sees a symbol on the side of the craft a red symbol and he draws it takes a note and lonnie was a, a, a policeman okay uh and the first thing he does after having the experience is he asks to see a priest like this is so you, uh, you that kind of gives you an idea of right, like yeah, what, what it, the way it affects people. Right. He asks to see a priest. Meanwhile, some some researcher much later looks at the symbol that Lonnie had drawn that he saw on the side of the craft. And the guy's like, wait a minute. And he digs through his records and he finds out that that's the ancient Arabic symbol for Venus. Right. So what what is it? What is that? What is that about? Like, you know, people are like, well, it came from Venus. Well. Do they live on Venus? Are they just messing with people? Some of them did tell people that they were from Venus and Mars. And or is that where the Arabs got the symbol? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. I don't know. So. All right. I'll try to lay this, lay this out. Um, <laughs> about the spiritual versus nuts and bolts thing. If uh, I believe... Um, in the spirit realm, right? I believe in, in the existence of uh, spirituality, whatever. So if it really exists, if there is some, you know, if there's that uh, realm, right? Alternate universe, however you want to look at it, that sort of coincides with our own, but we are in some ways connected to it, through uh, our consciousness, but maybe not 
really well connected for the most part. But nevertheless, if that universe is also here, right, all around, yeah, then it seems like if we have even a minuscule connection to it, then it's possible that other biological beings could have greater connections to it. Some people have better connections to it than others. Yeah. So across species, um, it's plausible that some could have really, really good connections to it. Or perhaps mostly be there. And in part be here in this realm. And so if you were developing technology and this was like a well-known to your species part of your your existence not a not a a question that we all have like us right the humans have this idea that you know there is this aspect but you know it's kind of weird it's hard to really pinpoint what's going on but if you had that really solid connection with it and your entire civilization did then your development of technology would encompass yeah. those things too yeah so yeah you'd build stuff out of nuts and bolts but also you would build it in concert with the abilities of the other realm. Yeah. And your ability to manipulate things in that realm, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot of the weirdness could be <clears throat> due to our inability to, to perceive perfectly from that other realm. Yes. And, it, and, and I was thinking, you know, making the, the connection to like a dream, these things are kind of strange like dreams are. You're riding on a whale. You're a cat. You have a tribe. A trident. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, they're really strange. Um, and sometimes there's a really well uh, laid out story in a dream, but then there's just some crazy odd thing that just doesn't make any sense yeah. in the middle of it somewhere. Yep. So it's like maybe that is that's always happening to us in these sort of encounters because it's very much like a dream state. That connection. That's why people have the imprinting type of, or whatever you call it, the, the co-creation. Yeah, yeah. Because they're not actually able to perceive the spiritual aspect of it properly. And so it's more a, um, an interpretation in their brain yeah, as to what they're seeing as opposed to actually seeing it for what it is. Right. And even then, it leaves physical traces, which is really interesting, right? It's like, <clears throat> but I mean, there's nuts and bolts craft. Yeah, right. Physical, I mean, that's physical objects, whatever they are. Physical objects, yeah. yeah. So that, what I'm saying is, is, if you were a society or a culture or a, a being that had this like intense connection with this alternate realm, yeah, you're building stuff in both worlds, yeah, together, right. And so this is the this is so maybe the the motion of the objects could be a mis like like our our instruments pick it up doing that but it's not actually doing that if you consider both worlds right so this would be the <clears throat> the interdimensional like another way to say it maybe more <clears throat> like a, a like a i don't know if scientific term is the correct word but what you're describing yeah, I'm trying is, to couch it in terms of science but that's really hard <laughs> well i mean what you're saying is spiritual but i i think that like you know the both worlds thing like the, it it could be described as interdimensional the other realm yeah, yeah. is wh whatever it is they're from and there are ideas that that, but I mean, uh, ancient peoples describe their encounters as visions. Yeah. In many cases. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. And there are visions <clears throat> that are described in modern UFO cases as well. That's what which I mean. What makes it really interesting. Like they have yeah. an encounter with a nuts and bolts something or other. Yeah. But they also have visions at the same time. Yeah, they see pictures in their heads or they see pictures that appear to be out there yeah. that maybe aren't exactly. Or they pick up the information just yeah. telepathically. Yeah. So it's there's also it's a healing. lot like a dream. <clears throat> healing is associated with, like anomalous healing is associated with many UFO cases, like modern ones. People are healed of wounds. You know, when the light hits them, they, they get all these pictures in their head. They're suddenly, they're, they're frozen. They're paralyzed. They hear buzzing noises. And then later they realize that some wound they had or some ancient old injury is gone. Doctors don't understand. Like cataracts disappear from their eye. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it, the, 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 it's common. And it's like, in, it, it's, this is the same in religious stuff. You know, the, 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 the healing that takes place. And then in some cases, visiting the site can cause 
continued healing after a while, you know, over time. And then there's the, the you know, this, this connection with crop circles is interesting because if you go back far enough in modern stories, they used to call them saucer nests. Okay, when they, they first started seeing these things, they're basically flattened circles of grass or marshy areas, you know, and they called them saucer nests because, and they were associated with somebody seeing a craft land or, or take off from the ground there. And they go out and they find a big circle in the grass. And then there's all this anomalous stuff in the, and people take soil samples because they think there was a craft there. They take soil samples and it's weird and there's like the strange things have happened to the soil. And then later nothing will grow there, but a circle of mushrooms shows up. So now you have a fairy ring, right? Mm -hmm. And the mushrooms are, are abnormally large. And then when you go back and you look at the, the, the fairy faith in Celtic countries, they would describe fairy rings out there and they would say, yes, the fairies grow these and they use the mushrooms to sit on. And they're actually large enough to sit on because they're huge, right? <laughs> they're giant anomalous mushrooms. Comfortable chair. Sometimes are phosphorescent, so they glow in the dark. Oh, that's cool. You know, so it's like weird. Th there's strange things like these saucer nests that, that if you go back far enough, they connect. And then there's the airship sightings. And yeah, I mean, it's stuff like they're dragging anchors along the ground. You know, and some guy comes out of the ship and climbs down the rope like yeah. he's underwater and he's got to cut the anchor free from whatever it's caught. And he sees all the people and he freaks out like he's like going down underwater. And then there's all these people down there, <laughs> you know. Yeah. There was actually one story where he gets down close enough and the people, because uh, they all come out of church because they hear the anchor like drag across the top of the church and then it gets <laughs> caught. Right. And they come out and they see the guy coming down the rope. And a bunch of them grab onto him, and the bishop is like, "No, no, let him go. He he might suffocate because they can tell that it looks like he's coming down from a ship, mm. like he's in water." And they let him go, and the guy freaks out, and he just cuts the rope and <laughs> climbs back up. You know, you're like, "What is going on here? What is happening?" So, I just can't imagine that the disclosure, if there is any disclosure that's going that's happening right now, is going to be able to address any of that stuff. It's too far out the edge. In of, that way. They're just going to address whatever the nuts and bolts aspect, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, I have heard some people, expl you know, explain how this changes people's lives, but I, I just can't imagine that they're going to be able to really see how weird this phenomena is, you know. So that's that's my that's my take on what's happening right I now. I agree. And I mean, it's hard. It's hard enough to. Uh, it's impossible, actually, to weed out the stories that are just not factually correct. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. So the good ones are the ones with multiple witnesses and multiple ways of checking, right. and those are the ones that, you know, in general, those are the ones that that are in Valet's books. So if you're going through, if you read Messengers of Deception, and then when you get into things like Messengers of Deception, when you get into Revelations, and when you get into uh, the Invisible College, then he starts describing how the intelligence agencies get involved. And then it gets even more complicated. because So you have the phenomenon itself. You Then you have hoaxers, people who are just making hoaxes. But then you get the intelligence agencies or whatever it is, maybe branches of the military, who knows what they are. Some of them seem to be esoteric organizations. And they start, and the, and the uh, whatever these other organizations are, are staging basically what are hoaxes that are incredibly complicated with lots of witnesses and, and they, re, and it really messes with people. And it, and it, it seems to, there's this overlap with the phenomenon itself, because then later there's a big, flap of sightings and symbols from what is almost clearly an intelligence hoax show up in actual sightings in a different country years later and you're like wait a minute as What's though they knew it was going to happen or something yeah or or the phenomenon itself is no it knows about the hoax and because it likes to be weird and on the fringe merges some of those symbols from the hoaxes into its own appearances in a like different country loki yeah it's trickster like and it it takes it takes people years later looking back through files of multiple countries to put these two things together and say, wait a minute, why is that symbol on this what looks like a legitimate UFO flap in Russia? Can well, I, I mean, okay, but the other way it could be looked at is that that similar to stuff we've been going through in hidden history, where like this guy finds a 
pretty legitimate find. And then somebody else comes along and is like, oh, yeah, I put the skeleton there, you know, blah, blah, yeah. blah, and turn it into a hoax. Yeah. Even though it actually was legitimate. Yeah. Do some things that make it seem like a hoax. After the fact. Yeah. 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 And there's, the, you know, the other aspect of it is <laughs> the possibility that whatever this phenomenon is may be able to, well, okay, if you, if you, if you begin to make the connections using pattern recognition to more, uh, to older phenomena like the fairy and even the, let's say the magic practicing of the middle ages, then you get into the concept of people who are saying it is possible to, through certain rituals to make pacts with these beings and they will show up on command. Okay. That was definitely a consideration with the Fae. Solomon. Yeah. And with Solomon. So now you are, now the question is, is are these the demons and the angels? Yeah. You know, and that raises the question is, is if certain shadowy government agencies have been looking into this have they been making pacts with this these things using old ancient rituals <laughs> and that's why symbols show up in weird places that seem to cross over with you know is that why these things seem to merge when you see the really complex things that look like a hoax they seem to merge with the phenomenon a little bit and that's why because they're they are merging in some way hmm. no idea yeah i don't i don't either i'm not i'm not actually asking a question for an answer i'm just posing it as a thought experiment like could this be taking place and this is what's muddying the waters and then you know of course plenty of sightings are going to be uh, i'm not i'm not actually talking about the sightings that are probably advanced tech that are that are that is experimental and human you know when you when you again i keep referencing valet but when you go through his books he's pretty good at weeding that stuff out and weeding out the things that are clearly hoaxes, except when he wants to show you a specific hoax thing to show you how this works and what people are doing and where these hoaxes come from. Yeah. You know, and then the other thing is the UFO cults that uh, show up. They have been. The phenomena seems to and seems to purposefully generate new religions on a regular basis. Most of them don't take. They get a few followers. Some of them get thousands of followers. Some of them get tens or hundreds of thousands of followers. None of them recently have become global religions. But it's like... All we need is a cataclysm. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like that. that's what they've been doing all this time is seeding these belief systems. Yeah. Okay. Joseph Smith. Yeah. Most recent one. Right. Probably <laughs> probably the most recent large one that got started. Yeah. It's really weird. So it's, you're kind of going all Bramley on it again. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the guy has an interesting take. Yeah. They definitely act like the custodians. Yeah. In some way. And the other thing, that, the, the, the other point that Valet makes that I totally agree with is we can't say that they're from space. They're just... No, no, not enough evidence to well, say that, that to say that they aren't from here. In other words, okay. And I, I kind of agree with that. I don't know if that means they're living in the water, or they're living in some other dimension, or they live underground, or all of the above, or if they're if you can't even really talk about it that way. But I definitely agree that whatever it is has been here a long time. And it doesn't and we don't really have any evidence that says that they except for things that they tell us, but you know, that the are the things that it the phenomena tells the, the people that it contacts, but it tells people that it contacts different things all the time about where they come from. So some people take that to mean that there's lots of different ones and all right. they come from a bunch of different places, but I don't know. So one of the criticisms uh that that many people, including Graham Hancock, have of Sitchin was that right at the time of the technological development of rockets and all this all this stuff, Sitchin comes up with this whole rocket ship analogy for all these ancient texts. Yeah. Convenient, right? Yeah. He's putting his own cultural overlay onto these ancient things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah except when you consider the, the 
the idea that right when we got the nuclear technology, that all this crazy stuff started happening, and then we started getting crashes and all this weird yeah. thing going along with that. Yeah. And uh, what was my other point about that? Um, I just lost it. Well, anyway, that's I was just trying to make that connection that that maybe it's not a coincidence. Yeah, right? I don't think it is. That oh, okay, I remember these guys that we got from you know after the war, all the scientists and stuff from Germany and everything that came over here yeah. were ultimately the ones developing the rockets and all of that tech. What were they doing? They were going all over the world looking. <laughs> Looking at ancient, at ancient sites. stuff, yeah, right? that's right. Like, you're right. You're right. Okay, I see the connection now. So yeah. yeah, like Sitchin, it just happened to be. Maybe that's the coincidence that he happened to be doing this and grew, grew up in this time period and happened to be looking at all of these things that actually do correlate to the technology at the time. Yeah. So yeah, because there is a correlation. Is what there you're is saying. a correlation. Yeah. Yeah, he wasn't putting a cultural overlay on it. The cultural overlay was was the ancient one being put on the modern one That's by right. the German scientists. That's right. Okay, because of their research into ancient mysteries and yeah. civilizations. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see that. Yeah, and we've talked about it too. That it, you know, is it why did they start naming all of the spaceships after you know gods? Ancient and, gods. You know. Yeah. <laughs> this new moon, moon was, thing you just named it is like Artemis. I'm like, come on, what are they doing? <laughs> what is going on here? <laughs> was it Artemis? I can't remember if it was Artemis or... The new moon mission? Yeah. I think it is, yeah, something yeah. like that. I mean, now it's following the trend, but, you know... Yeah, there, it's following the there's trend. There's a group of dudes at NASA who come up with these names. <laughs> and you're like, I'm, I just want, I want to ask them, like, why are you but, doing this? Yeah, the guys that were coming up with the original names aren't aren't with us anymore. Right. These guys are following the trend, you know, the Gemini and Apollo. Yeah, so my point is, is that when that was actually being developed, yeah. they were coming up with those names on purpose. Yeah, this was on not, purpose not, for sure. Not just for fun. Yeah. So. Yeah. And and if they, you know, there there is a common message that seems to be given in a lot of these cases. Um. And again, the cases that 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 Valet goes through in his book are are complicated ones that include close encounters of the third and fourth kind. Like they, they, it isn't just seeing lights in the sky, unless that is the only way he tells you. Like somebody saw a craft, and that's it. Is when it it takes place around or nearby, right at the same time as somebody else actually encountering the beings and the craft landing. You know, you know. It's, yeah. So he's going through complex cases with multiple witnesses, sometimes with radar returns. All that kind of stuff. So you aren't looking at... They're, they're well documented and have many witnesses that were interrogated, you know, like... like Debriefed. Debriefed by the police and stuff. And there's this common motif across a lot of them where sometimes, you know, in, in a large number of the cases, the aliens are... Or whatever they are, the beings seem to be concerned with whatever it is we're doing. You know, and they're like, oh, your nuclear weapons or, oh, you're destroying the planet or... Uh, Freaking watchers. <laughs> Dang it. Or Go back to your bag of chips. <laughs> or sometimes they just, they just, uh, you know, they're, they're telling the person that, uh, that things are going to change uh, and that they will return. Yeah. You know, but it, it, you do get the sense that they're, they're kind of playing with, with humanity as a whole and sort of trying in from the fringes from outside the edges of our understanding, somehow trying to guide us towards certain things psychologically by affecting large numbers of people, sometimes through one person, sometimes through mass sightings, you know, and it's never a global event, but yeah, I mean, I love my cat, you know, it's a great cat. Good fuzzball, <laughs> kind of fat. <laughs> I feed him well, try to take care of him, love on him. But every now and again, I bust out the laser. <laughs> <laughs> Just yeah. mess with his brain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yes, but are you guiding him towards something strange with that laser? <laughs> is it a long, you know, this is a lifespan thing that you're doing over time that seems to be calculated to turn him into a different kind of cat by the end of his life? <laughs> <laughs> Because that's what this seems to be. <laughs> I just want to confuse him sometimes. <laughs> okay. And maybe that has some ultimate result that I'm not mm. smart enough to figure out. Right. <laughs> just ch- Surely there are some of those out there. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's take a break. And then we'll, uh, I think I'm done with this, right? Yeah. Done with this? Yeah, I think we can do some emails and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. All right. Snacks! guys we're gonna do a communications bonus ode but uh i just want to talk about ufos just for a little bit (laughs) (laughs) and here we are welcome to the last segment i should have (laughs) known i should have known yeah all right communications bonus segment yeah but it's not even for the communications (laughs) and yeah we will be having marty back to do more ufo episodes that are heavily researched and not like off the cuff like what i just did so those will be good. Got a couple of packages. Oh, yeah. We got some one-up boxes. Hang on, what, am I going to do this? Yeah. Oh, oh, I think I know what that is. It looks like a pyramid. <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is a pyramid. Wow. Oh, Whoa. man. Hey, it's an ashtray. It's a pyramid <laughs> ashtray. <laughs> oh All <my> right. <laughs> wow. That's awesome. It's, got, it's metal and it has hieroglyphs, hieroglyphs all over it. on it, and this is now my ashtray forever. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. <laughs> that is amazing. I'm super jealous. Uh, <laughs> Holy crap! Who sent that? That was from. That's got to be from Ann. There's no note in it, but uh, I'm pretty sure it's from Ann. Damn, that's thank a, you, Ann. That is, that is beautiful. All right, next package. Now this is from our good buddy Jeffrey Appling that's right who actually he mailed us the uh, gift that is supposed to be for the person who told us to go check out his his blog yeah and we still don't know who that person was because the comment was anonymous so whoever you are who put the comment up there on the website that said go check out this guy's blog yeah about ancient coring and what you know ancient technology uh, we have a gift for you yes and it's awesome um, but he also sent some other goodies in here. So, uh, and I think these goodies are for us because, you know, whoever you, whoever your anonymous is, uh, we're not giving you these. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so let's see. What, man, there's okay. There's three. There's a bag of stuff. And then so these are boxes. like they're like necklace. These are uh, necklaces that have stones that have. Uh, like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's cored them out. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Let so he's made that. one core to hang the stone from the necklace, and then he's got a star core in the middle of the stone in various places. There's a whole bunch of them in here. Wow, dude. So maybe we can give we these can out. We can give some of these out. Yeah. Those are beautiful. Hey, we could do uh, we could do super lucky uh, gifts. Yeah. Wow, thank you, Jeffrey. Yeah, there's a whole set of them in there. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, and they have notes. Or, or they have little... They have little scrolls attached to them too. <laughs> we'll have to check out. Yeah, we'll have to check out some of this. And then, okay, there's two boxes: Jewelry of the Gods by Appling Jewelry. Here, you have one. Oh yeah, another necklace. Looks like Mother of Pearl. Oh my gosh, this one is quartz. Oh wow, yeah, that's pearl with, with all the yeah. pores drilled through it. Stars Smooth. and stars and circles. And yeah, squares. Dude, look at these quartz crystals with the cord. Oh man, those are cool. <laughs> those are really cool. That's awesome. Man, thank you, buddy. These are these are awesome. Yeah, and a couple of pyramid necklaces here. Triangular nice. ones with the holes in them. Kind of looks like 
that looks like jade almost. God, but I don't awesome. really know what jade looks like. But it's green and beautiful. Man, thank you. This is these are really awesome. And so we have Yeah, it. so it says Jade, uh star shape holes in soft shell and star shape hole in core from tough nephrite jade from California. Oh mine doesn't have a label. But these are obviously these are quartz. Yeah. Thanks, That's Jeffrey. Cool. These are awesome, man. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, so we have some we have some awesome gifts to give out too, because there's a bunch of these. Yeah. <sighs> Jewelryofthegods.com, folks. Check it out. All right. Okay, uh, so emails. Let me pull these up here. And wow, these cores, the the little metal tool. Remember how he told us that? Uh, how they get stuck. You, you you push the metal tool in. You know, while the machine is running, you drive the metal tool through. Yeah. The stone, and if you shut it off while it's in there, yeah, it gets stuck. Yeah. And these are just definitely stuck. They are definitely stuck. <laughs> That's cool. Very cool. All right. This one's from uh, King Totally. It's called King Totally Returns. Ah, what's up, dude? <laughs> Boys, tis I, King Totally. Been a while. <laughs> Been listening back to some specific episodes lately, trying to find the episode where the series Hellier was mentioned. I happened to watch this series recently, and I would highly recommend it. It is unique, to say the least, but beyond the content itself, it broke the fourth wall into my own life and has not left. I remembered hearing someone mention Hellier on the show a while back, so I thought I'd tell you about the experience that happened to me. Okay, so before we get into the experience, I did mention it. I haven't seen it. It's, uh, but I'm, I am aware of it, and yeah, we probably do need to watch it. What's it about? Uh, it's about... I'm not sure exactly, but the people who oh. the people who made it are like paranormal investigators and really interesting people. And this is about who, them. Is mm -hmm. it a couple? Yes. Are you serious? Yeah. I gotta look it up while you're doing that. Okay. okay. It's called it's it's spelled like hell and then I E R. Hellier. Okay, so he says, There I was, watching a show about too many coincidences piling up. No spoilers, but I am about to discuss one example from the show that leapt off the screen and started laughing in my face. The researchers come across a blue balloon in the woods. No big deal. Later on, they're stopped by a felled branch across the road. When they get out to move it, they notice a shiny object in the woods nearby. Another blue balloon. Now this coincidence is neat, but that's about it. But it is soon revealed that a friend of the main documentarian across the country had previously sent him a video that he took while hiking in the desert. A video of a blue balloon floating down the hill towards him. He sent the video to the documentarian before Hellier was even a project idea. The email had the caption, something told me to send this to you. So I end this super neato episode and call it a night. And I head upstairs from my basement where I had come in that night after work. I had yet to go upstairs, and when I did, I walked into my living room to see a big blue balloon staring me in the face. I audibly shrieked, waking up my wife. My wife came out and told me our son had picked it out at the store that day, and he wanted me to have it. Super crazy. And that series also focuses on the idea that an initiation of some kind is happening to all of us. It's just yet another link in the chain of this great mystery we all spiral around, and definitely worth a watch. Anyway... Love you guys. Keep up the great work. Oh, and I just wanted to say thank you from the bottom of my slithering heart. You guys have inspired me to start my own podcast. I figure the more oh, of us sweet. spreading the good word, the better. If you got a minute, check it out. Peace and snakes! And his podcast is called The Deep Share Podcast. All right. I'll definitely check it out. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, the uh, one of the things that happens in Hellier, as I understand it, is the synchronicities. Um, so I think that's what he was talking about there. All right. So it's not made by who I thought it was. Okay. Just briefly there, but anyway. All right. This is from, uh, Isaac. He says, bros, I just found your podcast. Really feel bad that I've just discovered you. I'm a writer <laughs> West of San Antonio, and I'm currently working on a series of real world science fiction using quantum physics and prior catastrophic evidence. Oh, I'm big into esoterica and I'm a student of the world, constantly learning and would like to pry your minds and give some of mine as well. Let me know. Snakes. Cool, man. Yeah. Well, we, 
we uh, we pry our minds on the show every week. What? I was just looking at real world science fiction, quantum physics, and prior cast. Ah, that's cool. Yeah, should we go check out uh, Canyon Lake Gorge? <laughs> <laughs> Let's make a field trip. All right, this is called Bowling Pin Hats uh, from Jim. Yo, bros, just a thought. I think the classic pointed alchemist's hat is a legacy or a reflection or imitation of the ancient long-headed elongated skull. Egyptian's headgear. What do you think? From Jim. Yeah. Like yes. The, the, yeah. We talked about the witch's hat. Yep. You know, all these pointy long hat, long yep. head hats. Yep. Yeah, bro. Agreed. Yeah, and don't the bishops wear some kind yeah. of like fish head, long head thing? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they do. <laughs> All right, this one's from uh, from Shannon. He says, "Hey, Snake Bros, I'm really enjoying revisiting Ben's work in tandem with the brilliant bots, uh, Brothers of the Serpent perspective thrown in. So thank you for all the super sods. But seriously." <laughs> The need for you all to speculate in circuitous paths that just lead to more questions is over. See attached. Okay, so what's what's attached here? Impossible Ox. Oh, okay, this is an, exp an explanation of Impossible Ox and a Crystal Shamir vibrating stones using psychic powers. <laughs> it's all drawn out. It's really cool looking. <laughs> yeah, dude, that looks cool. Using the third eye. <laughs> what does it say? No more speculation. This is how it works. That's right. Is yeah. It? <laughs> There's a shaman with a, a puma tattoo on the chest <laughs> being able to do all this stuff. <laughs> Mystery solved. Cool. <laughs> okay. This is uh, from Zach. D it's called Proof of the Arrow of Time. Dear Serpent Brothers. Damn it, Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> Here I present to you the unequivocal proof of the arrow of time. I live in Montana, and like you Texans like to boast about your state, everything up here is big, except the population, and generally very far apart. I commute roughly 120 miles a day going from my home to my shop and back. Is that it? Come on, bro. Come on, bro. <laughs> that's nothing. I mean, that's like going to the store. <laughs> I almost always listen to your mostly coherent ramblings, and while I keep it more or less in between the lines on the highway, well... Uh, when, uh, well, when I can see them because driving in the snow sucks. <laughs> anyway, because I drive so much, I was just about to roll my Nissan Pathfinder over to 200,000 miles, and I had planned on taking a picture of it when it happened. But, alas, I was completely enthralled, as usual, with your conversations and totally missed my opportunity to do so and overshot by a few miles. Oh. Thus, I present to you my irrefutable evidence of the arrow of time. There ain't no way I can roll the wheels back to get my pick. You guys always talk about strange coincidences and interesting connections, and, well, the episode I was listening to was number 150, The Arrow of Time. <laughs> if that happened to me, I would have been mad at us. <laughs> <laughs> I am a custom knife and tool maker and plan on sending you a pretty epic one-up box as a thank you Ooh. for the brain expansion and the strange one-sided friendship I have developed with you longheads whom I have never actually met but hope to someday. You two always make me smile and laugh, and boy, let me tell you, some days it is really needed. So thank you for all you do, and keep the laughter, laughter up. Be excellent to each other, and party on, dudes. <laughs> <laughs> From Zach. <laughs> P.S. Please send me your address for the box. All right, I'll do that. I guess I haven't done that. I'm sorry. I'm way behind on this. Remind me to send this guy the address. Yeah, dude, hey, we appreciate the, uh, I mean, it, it is, it's a two-way friendship. Because, I mean, you know, knowing that all of y'all are out there. Uh, it makes the show what it is. Yeah, you know, it really, it really has uh, just made it a, a a pleasure to come in here. Absolutely, and stare at the wall and, and talk because <laughs> <laughs> we know you're there. That's right. <laughs> okay, let's see. This is from David, not Getson, but the uh, another David. It says, uh, it's called virtually exploring lost civilization. Hey, snakes. Love the show and been digging the swap casts. You guys have great energy and passion and often get me back on track with my own projects and writing. I wanted to share with you a project I've been working on over the past few years, been capturing and photographing ruins around the world for a virtual reality project called Before Our Time. 
I've captured some 22 plus sites so far and have hours and hours of 8K 3D 360 footage. Oh man. At some point, I think the sites in the US would be great to cover too, especially the channeled scablands. I've been there in Google Earth VR, but getting some focused and detailed photography and scans would be killer. If you have a VR headset, I'm happy to share some of the footage. Hey, I just so happen to have an Oculus Quest 2. <laughs> anyway, I just wanted to say hi and let y'all know I've been tuning in for a while and really appreciate the content and the perspectives. I'm currently living in the Sacred Valley by Ollante Tambo and Pisac oh. and have been and have enjoyed being stuck here during quarantine. It's really amazing visiting all the sites when nobody's around. I've even met up with Brian and his local guides a few times. Well, if you ever need a live correspondent down here, just drop me a line. All the best from David. And by the way, his website that he gives for this stuff is www.beforeourtime.ca. So if you guys want to check out the stuff he's been capturing, that's where to go. Cool. And yeah, thanks, David. That's really cool. And that's cool you got stuck down there during the, <laughs> during the lockdown. <laughs> what a place to get stuck, right? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one's called, uh, I think this is also from Jim. This is called Oyante Tambo School of Rock Shaping. <laughs> Oyante Tambo looks like it might be a training site for stone cutters. The soft limestone is not really good for quarry stone, but a good practice material. I was a firefighter for 28 years, and when we had training with the jaws of life, we would tear abandoned cars apart on the training ground. With the jaws, it was easy, and we would leave a mess of twisted steel that somebody unfamiliar with the mechanical rescue tool system we were using would look at the aftermath and ask, WTF happened here? Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, buddy. Really interesting idea. And yet it gives you uh, an understanding of the tools so that when you actually go to do it in the real uh, scenario, you know how to use it without, you know, like you know how to use the tool properly without yeah, yeah. getting the results you want. And that's why some of it looks results. whimsical, right? They're practicing yeah. out there in yeah. the mountains cutting with yeah. the, with the Very old, cool. old Shamir. Great connection. Yeah. Love it. He also says, oh yeah, remember to consider your Australian fans. There are no snakes, snakes down under. There are snikes. <laughs> <laughs> spelled S-N-I-K-E-S that's not a snike snikes <laughs> thanks again love what you guys are doing <laughs> snikes <laughs> snikes <laughs> uh, okay this is from John <laughs> it's called <laughs> it's called howdy from the not so frozen anymore north from John howdy howdy from Minnesota you can say my name on the podcast if you read this. First, my only regret is I did not find your podcast sooner. You guys kick ass and your music is slick. Hey, thanks, buddy. Second, I do not Pull know how trash. much I do not know how much fiction you read, but your musings have brought me back to a story by H.P. Lovecraft. Actually, two of them: "At the Mountains of Madness" and "The Shadow Out of Time." Yes, dude, those are two of my favorites. <laughs> two of my favorites. <laughs> The Shadow Out of Time is about a man whose spirit gets pulled into the past and placed in the body of a species that ruled Earth in the past, and he gives a short paragraph to other beings that ruled and would rule Earth. It is fascinating to think about this kind of thing, and I would love to hear your thoughts on the book. It is short and easy read, thankfully, because big words are hard and the Marines didn't teach me to read goodly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so, okay. Okay. The Shadow Out of Time, to give a, let's see, uh, he, okay, the story, basically the premise of the story is this guy, suddenly his personality totally changes, and then he becomes, he starts traveling all around the world, he starts giving, con he seems to be much smarter, and he becomes much more interesting, and he starts to get in, like, like he goes all, uh, uh, Comte de Saint Germain, like he starts yeah, yeah. getting in with all the top people and he's talking to people and this, it lasts for, I don't know, four years or something. Uh, and then he changes back, right, to who he was before. And he has to, the person, what, what, after he changes back, he starts, he has, to, he has to recover this lost four years because he doesn't remember anything. He's just like suddenly he's somewhere else and his life is different. <laughs> he's like, what the hell? And then he starts having, he asks around and he finds out that he did all this stuff during all this time. And he has nightmares also uh, about crazy things. And eventually he begins to learn to, I can't remember if he gets hypnotized or he learns to explore his nightmares, but he basically finds out that what happened to him, the, the premise is, is that 
in the deep past, there was a totally different civilization of earthlings that were like, think old ones. They were very powerful, psychic. They, they totally were not bipedal hominids. They were something completely different living in the Carboniferous era of ancient earth. And they, bec they became extremely technologically advanced. And one of the researches that they used to do was reach out into the future and grab onto some intelligent being there and swap spirits. Right. So they would send one of their spirits into that person's body way in the future to learn about what Earth was going to be like way out, way long after them. Meanwhile, that person would get snatched back into their time and inhabit one of their bodies. Right. So over time, the guy recovers his memory of being this crazy, like cephalopod like thing from the ancient past and exploring their libraries. And they get him to write down some of his he learns about them. He learns that they're actually afraid of the ruins of an even more ancient civilization. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw that in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, I, I don't... I've, is it weird to give spoiler alerts on, on, on a story that's like 100 years old? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but... Go read the story. Go read the story, because the end is the, is the part that you want to hear, to read. Uh, so, yes, I love that story. I love it. And there there are audio versions available that you can find on YouTube because people have read them. You know, H.P. Lovecraft cool. is in the. Uh, yes. And then the other one that he mentions is the Mountains of Madness. And that one is a, uh, a story about exploring. I, I can't remember if it's Antarctica or the Arctic. I think it's Antarctica. And the same thing happens. They find not the same thing, but they find evidence of the old ones there, yeah. like a very ancient civilization living in our, in our, they start finding their artifacts and they find an entrance that goes down into the city that's now completely buried. And it, it drives them crazy because it's so weird, you know, hmm. <laughs> it sounds great. And it's the same deal. They find out that those ancient beings who are terrifying to us, were terrified of something even older. It's, it's classic <laughs> HP Lovecraft. <laughs> He says, finally, if this is not too long, you've given me a new lens to look at the world through. The North Shore of Lake Superior has always been one of my favorite places to go, but I never considered how it, how it became such a stunning landscape until I heard you talk about how the earth changes. So thank you for opening my eyes to this. If you are ever in Minnesota or want to check out what we have up in the north, don't hesitate to reach out. You have a snake friend up here now. Really, finally, I sent you some fossils from the Tibetan Plateau a few months back. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, here they are. And I always they assumed they got there when India crashed into China. But could those deep sea fossils have landed there due to a catastrophic flood? Anywho, keep kicking ass, laughing, and making music. Snakes! From John. <laughs> Thanks, John. And yeah, you know, uh, old History Shift is out there, too. So uh, you guys ought to hang out if you haven't already. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, There's another one from Jim. <coughs> Okay, on episode 188, Ben says he doesn't know where the slab of rock came from. It looks like it was precision cut and pulled from the rock face above and to its left. Then left for display as a trophy or example, supporting this training theory I had. I wonder what the measurements are of this slab in the cutouts. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, yeah, he's, he's watching the swap casts and commenting on them, basically. Yeah, I, I, I know what slab of rock you're talking about. It's it's like that flat. It's like it looks like a tabletop. It's kind of leaning up. Against, oh yeah 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 yeah. In 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 the Serapium. Yeah. No no. It's 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 in Peru. Oh, in Peru. Yeah. It's up in the mountains. It's like leaning up against. It's like a random, beautifully cut slab of rock leaning up against an area. And I asked. I was like, "Where did that come from?" Uh, like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, uh, I was thinking of the um, the doors in the Serapium. Oh yeah, the slabs of uh, granite that are yeah. just leaning up. Yeah, well, I th yeah, I think Jim is saying that he thinks it was that slab. It's in Peru. Is leaning up. He thinks it was just cut out of a nearby rock okay. that he could see. Possibly, Jim. I don't know. I think that uh, my instinct is that Ben would have known about that if that's what people. That's if that's clear. But maybe you're right. Who knows, man? Uh, Okay, this is called Wine and Catastrophism from Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, serpents. My name is Ryan, and I am an avid fan, a listener, investigator of your work and your colleagues, and I'm so honored to be able to have the opportunity to follow you guys and enjoy everything you're doing. I am also a beverage enthusiast and started a project of hard cider making in rural Maine, and we are looking to do a lot of synchronicity as far as blending grapes into the cider 
listening to your passion with your grapes, we're doing very similar thing, cultivating, growing here on the property. But I would be wondering if you would recommend any Texas grape vineyard that sells juice or must that you guys would recommend thinking, uh, recommend thinking that I follow you for your knowledge about catastrophism. I would wonder if you had any recommendations on wine to follow. I appreciate your time very much and thank you for all your work. Keep it up and enjoy the ride from Ryan. Well, um, not the vineyard specifically, but maybe contact William and Chris winery, ask them, um, because they do source, uh, <coughs> you know, grapes, fruit from the high plains in Texas. And also they have some local vineyards and Bill Blackman is, uh, one of the best, uh, authorities on growing grapes. Yes. And so even when it comes to vineyards that they don't own as the, as the winery that's buying the fruit, they have, uh, they play a big part in the growing of the, of the grapes and he knows how to take care of them and uh, get a good product. So check out William and Chris, Bill Blackman is the William yeah. of William and Chris. Um, so that's one. Uh, and then another company that we are, uh, actually entering into a, uh, sort of a partnership. It's, cus it's called custom crush. Um, they're called slate mill and they have a very big operation. Uh, they do custom crush. So they, I, I'm not sure if they will source the fruit for you. They might though, if you're, I just don't know about transporting, right? Transport. Uh, transportation of the fruit is is because we're harvesting in August. It's very hot. Yeah. And it's so if the fruit has to be cooled or, or has to go quick. Yeah. If the fruit gets hot, it's uh, it's no good. That's bad news. So um, so yeah, you need to pre-order, and they need to know that they're going to send you cooled fruit all the way to Maine. Yeah, that's a long way. Yeah. I was talking about like. 30 hours of driving, yeah. Yeah. you know, for a trucker, it's going to be more. So, I mean, maybe the best bet would be to, um, have the winery make the wine first, just simply get it through uh, primary fermentation. Once it's through primary fermentation, then it could be much, I, I think it would be much easier to ship, uh, in a refrigerated truck. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't need that much. He wants to add it to their cider or something. Yeah, it also depends on how much you're making. Because if you're if you're making uh, if you're doing like batches in your garage or something, then maybe we can just send you some. Just get a big uh, cooler and throw some dry ice in there and ship it to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. I don't know. Um, it's interesting. So yeah, let us know uh, what your what what. Let us know more details. Yeah. All right, are we done? I see we're over over three hours here. We got still. Yeah, we went a little long on a couple of the segments, yeah. but I I I wanted to talk to you, all you people out there. Those of you who donate to the show, I do want to start doing um, the producer credits and um, um, you know executive producer and associate executive producer credits. Yeah, similar to what Ben's doing. So. And I'm not sure how to work this out as far as the, um, you know, the Patreon versus uh, PayPal. What I see is PayPal. Russ, Russ sees the Patreon. So we'll figure that out. My point is, if you donate $50 or more, um, we're, I'm, I'm basically going to want to read that your full name out, right? To give you the producer credit, we're going to put your full name in the credits, um, of the show. Yeah. Right. So, and they'll go in the show notes as well. Yeah. As, it'll be in the show as, notes as executive and associate so executive. If producers. you want to be anonymous and you're going to donate, uh, you're going to do a donation of $50 or more, then make sure to put a note. Like if you send it, if, if it's PayPal, there's a way to put a note in there, say, keep me, you know, anonymous. And I'll just, we'll just, you know, I mean, I don't know how you give a producer credit to anonymous. Yeah, we, we can't, can't do it. We can't. Yeah. So, yeah. If you're not cool with that, just say, keep me anonymous and we won't give you the producer credit. We will thank you on the show. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, we are going to start doing that. And I still have to give Russ the, uh, the, the names from the last show. 
Yeah. And so we, and I and I didn't say that you know prior to those donations. So just like if if you're one of those people from the last show that I was saying we're going to give uh, producer credits to, and you do not want your name put in the show notes in full, then let us know. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And um, we also have to work out how to get the Patreon content over to the PayPal donors, which is something I still have to figure out. It can't well, be done as far as I know. Yeah, I think that uh, I have access to their emails through PayPal. So I can actually, like, this will Yeah, take the a question bit. is, is, will I be able to get Patreon to give me this, the feed code for to give to people? And will it work on yeah. multiple people's devices? Yeah. Because the Patreon content is going to go up on a Patreon feed, basically. And, and every Patreon, every patron on Patreon gets their own custom feed code for that feed. Uh, I yeah, just, so we got to work out some details. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll figure it all out. We're, we're trying to do more for the people who donate. Yeah. And that's basically it. And in, you know, classic Snake Bros style, we're working it out on the show <laughs> right, right now. That's right, right. <laughs> we're actually ca- talking to each other about how this is not going to work on the show right now. So <laughs> be prepared for things to not go as we've been talking about them just now. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Do we have any producers for this show? Yeah, but I'm not going to read the guy's full name because uh, I hadn't said any of that yet. Yeah, but, but you just, did, um, he, did he give a comment or no comment? Okay, no comment. But right. definitely a uh, a an executive producer donation. All right, thank you so much, um, anonymous. Let's see here. Where is it, John? There you go. Thanks, John. Hundred bucks. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, that's yeah, straight up, dude. So yeah, if I can uh, send us an email, and I'll we'll we'll put your full name. Is on. there a way you can reply to them there? Uh, well, we'll figure this out. I have his <laughs> email. Here, <give> <laughs> <laughs> we can figure this out off air. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess that's about it. Yeah, that's it. Thank you guys for the emails. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the UFO stuff. And I'm still clapping. You got me on the clapping thing, dang it. <laughs> it speaks the mic. Oh, I hear clapping. <laughs> All right. Well, you guys can find us, brothersoftheserpent.com. The email is brothersoftheserpent at gmail.com. Uh, but the website is where all the podcast-related stuff is, including the archive of shows. You can find that on the archive section. And the Pyramid Scheme, which you can donate to the show for uh, you know for whatever value we give you guys through Patreon or PayPal. And if you do want access to the Patreon content, which we are starting to make, uh, you can join the Patreon there. And uh, yeah, th- uh, join the Facebook group. There is a Facebook group also if you want to. And make sure you, you totally troll Brenner if you join the Facebook group. Right. Blow his phone up. Uh, <laughs> and again, thanks uh, thanks to all the admins in the Discord and all the snake, the snake force in the Discord. You guys are great. Uh, always great conversations going in there. So if anybody is not in the Discord and you want to join it, there is a place to join the Discord chat on the website as well. You can see it there on the sidebar is Discord chat snake pit, and then there's a connect button when you go there. Uh, and yeah, the Discord is is managed by Jeff, and then we have a whole crew of admins. And I need to I need to get a list of the admins so that I can I can call out their names because they do a lot of work and I tried to do it last week and I didn't have a list in front of me and I know I missed people so sorry about that to all of you who I missed uh, I will get a, a list of you guys so I can thank you through your through your Discord names on the show uh, but yeah and also of course always always a shout out to History Shift for all the work he puts in for making the YouTube videos thank for you, every episode yeah uh, and Pod Doodles. And uh, Soraya, of course, this, the episode we did with him has come out in his main feed, so I know many of you heard that and commented on it. Uh, so yeah, check out uh, check out Where Did the Road Go, and thanks to Soraya, and also Ben from Uncharted X, of course. And the guys up at Grimerica, and uh, the Cosmographia team, and all of you listeners out there. We love you. We always have. Always love. Sign up for Egypt. <laughs> Good night, Adamu. Get back to work. Mm-hmm.